Okay, it's uh, it's six thirty. So, if we are ready, um, I will call the meeting to order. And um, we have one member who's here uh, remotely, so we'll recognize Carrie Brown. Hello, Carrie Brown, District Three. Okay, thank you. Now, <clears throat> the uh, I'll mention a couple of uh, comments about logistics. Anyone who's joining us remotely, please change your name uh, name display to your first and last name so that we can know who's addressing us. Um, anyone who's called on to speak, we'd ask you to state your first and last name and where you live so that we have that for the minutes. Um, we would ask your, you to keep your comments for under three minutes. And if you're speaking about a specific agenda item, please keep your comments germane to uh, to that item. Anyone who wishes to speak must be recognized by the mayor. And if you have any questions to ask, please get them all out at one time, so then we'll be able to uh, address them all. And anyone who speaks out of turn goes on too long or speaks on non-germane topics may be interrupted and asked to send us your comments privately. And I should also say that anyone who has comments that you think are longer than we have time for tonight, we're always happy to uh, accept comments in writing or electronically, and we will uh, they will be shared with everyone on the council. Um, first item now is to approve the agenda. Any changes or comments to the agenda? Okay, we can proceed with the agenda as is. First item on Next item is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any item that is not on the agenda. Uh, we ask your comment, you keep your comments to three minutes and uh, Councillor Bate will assist us in uh, keeping time. We'll start with the people in the room. Yes. My name is Nolan Carver. I'm from Ward 1 here in Montpelier. This is my first um, meeting here, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm also a nominee to be on the board for the, the Conservation Commission, which I look forward to. Um, I was reviewing um, last um, council's meeting. Um, I was concerned about item F. That was an interesting point of, of debate there. Um, I do thank you, Councillor Salafano and Carrie Brown as well, uh, for bringing up what appears to be a conflict of interest from my personal perspective. Could you remind us what uh, item that was? Yes, I sure will. Item F was from the um, toy run. This was brought by Clarence Wheeler, president of the United Motorists of Vermont. Um, I believe you have our street closure on your agenda, is how he um, started out, as you'll recall. Um, Police Chief Nordenson, is there a conflict of any sort, politically or otherwise? Um, I ask this question again rhetorically to you all to consider now. Um, I believe there is a conflict of interest. Um, are we intent on enabling 500 choppers to come storming through our city uh, only to uh, share space uh, with the autistic and highly sensitive persons struggling with a neurodivergent perspective and a society which tends to marginalize them in a sense, they deserve to be seen and heard. Um, we all deserve to be seen and heard, certainly. Uh, motorcyclists uh, certainly as well. Um, I was hoping that we could, as a society, um, arrive to some certain compromise or or civility here. There seems to be a certain sensitivity that I would simply like to remind you all of. Let's please reconsider this this dynamic in this uh, scenario. It's a very interesting uh, controversy, and I'm I'm pleased to be a part of this controversy. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. They have, they have, they have um, 
they're doing a different route this year. They're not going to be coming through the city this year because of the conflict. Um, they, the motorcycle people realize it was their failure to reserve the state house. So they're going to, I don't even know if they're coming into Montpelier this year, but then they'll be back to, they'll do it more properly. So it is resolved. And I think you, we all understood the conflict. With all due respect, Bill, um, I do regret to say that I was perfectly abused by the Shriners two years ago on the state house lawn. I do remember that specifically. I had in fact filed a police report with Montpelier police and a report with the uh, state of Vermont. There's no excuse for abuse. I agree. Thank you thank, for your thank, interest. Thank, thank you. Um, Steve Whitaker. Try to be time. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Try to be time efficient. I predicted this in the transcribe. Let's start with the website. It's gone from bad to worse, or from worse to pathetic. Even to find an agenda for tonight's meeting was way more difficult than it used to be. There's no excuse for that. We should have scrapped the software, moved to a new platform. We appropriated, I think, fifty thousand dollars, and it got bungled or wasted. Uh, not surprised. Recent concrete work in front of the TD Bank. Uh, highly unprofessional, hazardous trip. You know, basically, you walk around town, you know what you're looking for. Please do. We should be. We should have somebody inspecting the work that's get done. Many of the storm drains are off grade for the water. And the water piles up School Street, Elm Street, and the cars go by and shower anybody walking down the sidewalks. I've mentioned this again and again, seen no action. It's piling up in the crosswalk, not even up to the minimal standards of professionalism. It should have been subbed out. If we don't, if we can't do it right, don't do it because you make the pay, public pay. For a second. second and third time to get it done. The new street furniture, you know, big ego M for Montpelier. Those are no substitute for public restrooms. You've been hearing about public restrooms since four years ago when I persuaded the council then to create the homelessness task force. We've made no progress. It's unconscionable to keep the transit center bathrooms locked, the city hall bathrooms locked, Mother's Day, and after five or six o'clock, it's and we've got a new influx of people who are unhoused in town. It's cruel and then you, so. Uh, I've already said that, I, I had, had lived it and covered my, I believe it's an obstinate subversion of the public interest and it's a violation of human rights. Shopping carts are still in the river after three or four years of telling you about them. The same carts are still in the river and the, a bunch of trash from around Shaw's just ended up into the uh, flow today from the high water. Uh, that should give you a clue that something's not working. This $200,000 a year mismanager is with his golden parachute, et cetera, is not doing the job of taking, addressing these issues that are raised at council and implementing solutions or reporting back to the council why he didn't. Um, the Automatic door openers, handicapped door openers on the Taylor Street side of the transit center still are not working. The wires are still hanging there. The, there's still no paddles for handicapped people coming up that ramp on Taylor Street to get into the building. I've described for you trying to follow a person in a wheelchair in who got caught between the doors. It, this is not, this is, we are not living up to the city we're pretending to be. And I think it's up to you to take seriously and take action on this. Uh, Green Mountain Transit is violating the lease agreement and getting away with it year after year to keep the bathrooms open from 11 to 2.30. And they do so so that they don't have to pay benefits to their employees. But okay, they thank you, Steve. That's, that's, that's time. Thank you. Well, the problem with you're not only taking written comments to the council is that the public who needs to kick y'all's rear end doesn't it doesn't get on video and it doesn't get to the public when you manage it through you know notes thank you that <clears throat> anything that is sent to us is public record anybody else in the room looking to uh, make a comment and is there anyone online who is looking to address the council i'm not seeing any hands but i want to make sure People have a chance. Oh, 
Okay, we can move to the consent agenda. Anyone want to, want to make a motion? I move that we pass the consent agenda. Yes, Lauren. Uh, I'm happy to second that, but I did have an amendment to the Juneteenth proclamation. Can we do it within this or is it cleaner sure. to pull that out? I think we can do it. Yeah. Why don't we pull it off and that way it's clear. Okay. Can I offer a friendly amendment then to pull item C, the Juneteenth proclamation from Sal's motion? Great. Okay. All those in any further discussion of the uh, consent agenda, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we've passed the consent agenda with the exception of item C. Uh, Lauren. So um, glad we are uh, doing the Juneteenth proclamation again. And I had just noticed that uh, the language that we were kind of refreshing from last year that since we'd written it, um, voters, it referenced um, a desire to pass uh, Proposition 2, a proposal to amend the Vermont Constitution to prohibit slavery and indentured servitude in any form, which Vermont voters did in November. Um, so I am suggesting that we just tweak that one, whereas, and John, for your records, I can just forward you language if people agree to it. That's I should have copied you on it, sorry. Um, so it would just read, and whereas in Vermont, the full goal of eradicating slavery was furthered by voters adoption of Proposition 2 in November, 2022, a proposal that amended the Vermont constitution to prohibit slavery and indentured servitude in any form. And then the rest the same as is so. Thanks, Lauren. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Carrie's very loud and I don't know if it's on our end or her end. Or could that be adjusted? Please the remote mic, the remote speakers. Can we do something? You can try to speak very quietly. <laughs> It's, I know it's a challenge for some people. <laughs> try, try it now. How's this? Any better? Still loud? Seems about the same, but. <laughs> okay. But that's okay. We appreciate everything you have to say, so I don't mind hearing. <laughs> All right. Next up. We have appointment to the conservation. Committee. And we have we have one applicant or we have more than one applicant, don't we? Mr. I know you're up and you have uh, you've applied for that, right? You want to step up and Address the council. It's Nolan Carver. I'm from Ward 1 here in Montpelier. And I'd love to serve on the Conservation Commission. I have a passion for the environment. I can I feel very strongly about environmental issues. Um, it would be a way for me to get involved in the community. I look forward to working and interacting with other human beings uh, towards a better a better world that we can eventually uh, hand down to a better generation. <laughs> Thank you for your consideration. Thanks. Any members of the council have any questions? Okay. Um, and Lindsay Chosinska, are you either here in person or on the phone? On I, I am here on uh, the Zoom call. Great. Great. You want to just say a few words about, about your desire to be on the committee? Uh, yeah, um, I did apply for this committee and the Historic Preservation Committee. Um, sorry if you could hear the thunder, it's pretty bad over here. Um, 
but basically I'm an, I'm an archaeologist um, and I kind of have worked um, in the past on uh, combining archaeology and studying the environment. Um, that was what my graduate school research was about, was about uh, actually sub, uh, was about tropical societies um, in, in the archaeological past and how that affected essentially the collapse of cities. But um, I, I do feel pretty strongly about, about both topics. And um, I, I do think I have some knowledge that could help uh, in both the Conservation Committee and the Historic Preservation Committee, because um, I feel like archaeology is uh, can straddle that uh, sort of crossover somewhat. So thank you for your consideration. Great, thank you. Any members of the council have any questions for Lindsay? Okay, and let's, while we're doing, talking about appointments, we have an application from Brian David Jones for the Development Review Board and Historic Preservation uh, Commission. Uh, is Brian David Jones present? Why don't you step up? Hi. Jones, could you get right up to the mic? Sorry, there we go, there we go. It's been a while. Um, my name is Brian Jones. Uh, I'm an architect uh, and I practice in Vermont and uh, Philadelphia and New Jersey. Uh, I used to live in Montpelier about 10 years ago and um, recently moved back about two years ago uh, with my wife and my daughter. Um, I, I'm interested in serving on the, uh, the um, development review board to kind of participate in contributing to the zoning and how to interpret it. Uh, I actually end up reading quite a lot of zoning uh, uh, regulations on the day to day. Um, and so that interest combined with just the desire to engage again and, and be a good uh, volunteering, you know, citizen uh, uh, is kind of what put me here. And uh, I've been working on a little uh, home renovation project. And so kind of uh, been very busy, but um, becoming less so um, many years ago. And I'm sure you folks are seeing some of this in the application, but I, I was a volunteer on the Addison County Regional Planning Commission as well uh, for about two and a half years in the Salisbury Planning Commission. And, uh, um, you know, just a great introduction to committees and bureaucratic uh, workings and um, and uh, joined the meeting last week and kind of felt at home again, uh, taking it all in. And, and uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, mm. professionally, there's a lot mm. of experience, uh, both working locally and being a part of maybe larger uh, planning um, and zoning code, uh, uh, you know, stuff that I'm still working with on a day to day. Um, but other than that, it's really just interest based and, uh, and um, civic volunteer based. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Any questions for any members of the council? I, I have a question for both uh, Lindsay and Brian. You both applied for two committees. Do you have a preference or do you want to be, do either of you want to be on both? Um, well, I would like to be on both. Uh, I was talking with Meredith earlier in the week in the application process, and I said I have a preference for the uh, Development Review Board because I just think it would be a better use of my of my skills and expertise. But uh, frankly, um, I do have pretty strong interest in in historic preservation as well. I um, had worked on a project recently uh, and uh, had a lot of joy in in saving an old an old project uh, in Philadelphia. But um, I think Meredith had actually emailed us yeah. earlier in the evening and both yep. positions may be available in that, in that respect. So anyway. Great. Thanks. Thanks. And Lindsay. Um, yes, I, I do have a pre uh, preference for the historic preservation committee. However, I am open to serving on both because um, I do feel passionate about both. However, I feel like my professional background definitely lends itself more to the historic preservation committee. Great, thank you. Okay, council, what's your preference? We have the ability to go into executive session and the chair would uh, entertain a motion to do that. If someone wants to make that motion. I move we go into executive session in accordance with Title I BSA 313, executive session A3 the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public officer or employee. 
Okay, is there, uh, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. And anyone opposed? Okay, we'll go into executive session and uh, we'll be back shortly. It's moved and seconded to come out of executive session. I did, yeah, thanks. Um, all those in favor, indicate by saying aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Okay. And now do we have a motion? Yes, we do. Um, I move that we appoint Nolan Carver to the Conservation Commission to the term expiring in 2024. And we appoint Lindsay Chazinska to the term expiring in 2025. Uh, the Development Review Board, I move that we appoint Brian Jones to the open term. And to Historic Preservation, I move that we appoint uh, Jones and Chazinska to the open term. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Hi. Anyone opposed? Okay, you are all appointed. Thank you for volunteering to serve. And also thank you to for coming out and uh, meeting the council. I think we all appreciate it when not applicants for our boards come and meet us so we know who we're appointing. Thanks for coming. All right, we are up to item eight. Session recap from legislators. So again, we have most of our legislative delegation here and thank you all for being here. Um, so why don't we start with the, uh, with the senators? Do you wanna come on up together? Or why don't you go all, co all come on up? Connor, you can come on up too, yeah. That's right, yeah. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. And I'll have you introduce yourselves to the people in, in attendance. How are you folks? Connor Casey, uh, state rep. You need the microphone. How soon, know, how know. soon they forget. How are you folks? Connor Casey, state rep. Good to be back. Senator Ann Watson, also good to be back. Senator Ann Cummings, it's also good to be back. <laughs> I have to start my campaign for mayor of Montpelier. <laughs> I'm uh, Andrew Perksick, State Senator. I live in Marshfield, not Montpelier, but it is a good to be back as just a citizen. And I'll note for the record that Representative uh, McCann had a family conflict. I believe her eighth grade graduation was tonight, so she had priorities in the right place. So she did send her regrets. She was texting her from texting me from the dark at Montpelier High School for oh, the graduation. I think they got the power on just before they started. Um, so what we're here for is just to have an informal conversation about how things went and what our accomplishments were for the year and what uh, we should be looking forward to next year. So, and you're the Dean of our delegation. So would you like to start? All right. <laughs> um, at this point, we won't know what we've accomplished till we finish the veto session next week because almost everything has been vetoed uh, of major bills. The one that went through was the housing bill. Um, and that, uh, I was disappointed it didn't go farther in um, allowing some more flexibility in the Act 250 and some more um, power to local communities. But we took a step. Um, and it was a hard fought step to get 
any movement to allow the towns to um, have more control over their development and to make it harder for two or three people in the town to overturn the will of the, the people. In the case of Montpelier, it was the voted will of the people. Um, we passed the child care bill, and uh, that has been vetoed. I'm pretty confident we will override that veto. It put, I think it was $125 million into child care um, basic subsidies and increased the payments, uh, the subsidy, the payment to the child care providers. I just read, I think it was the uh, Casey Foundation, Vermont came in. Third, I think, in child welfare, except in the area of affordable and available child care, in which we were tied for last. That is not someplace we need to be. We heard from businesses that they need workers. We have, I'm sure you know, a worker shortage, and um, this will allow more workers to either work um, or work full time, and we're hopeful. The governor does not like the payroll tax. We put, I think it ended up at being 0.43, maybe 4% 4, 4 divided between employer and employee, 75% uh, of the 0.43%, which is above my math skills, uh, goes to the employer. 25% of uh, that total cost goes to the employee. At the lowest level, that's like a nickel a paycheck. Um, and at the lowest level, you will get um, complete subsidy for your child care. So it should be a good trade off. Um, let's see, the budget, I think the one place we are uh, working out the what main difference between our what we spent and what the governor spent is that we increased payments to the community-based um, social services, basically home health and mental health services. I think we all know our schools are in crisis. They need mental health services. Our communities need them. Um, and we're going back and fight that, uh, fight that um, battle next week. Hopefully, we'll come out. We also, I see all the housing advocates are here. Um, Eben. I'd say disappointed. We were assured that there was a plan in place to help deal with the closing of the motels. It has not materialized. Um, there have been a lot of uh, negotiations that hit Digger today. Um, we are hopeful to uh, have something. Um, hopefully we can get uh, not vetoed that will at least allow the most vulnerable um, people that are ill, disabled, or families with children to be able to stay in motels. So I think that's that's the big ones. Great, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? You want to wait till we've all spoken? Why don't we do that? Well, when I thought about coming to the meeting, I thought of the priorities that I thought of the of the city council, and was disappointed to think that we didn't accomplish. The, th the three main ones, basically, we, we despite the eff good effort, we didn't get a bathroom uh, or ha help from the, f the state uh, on the bathroom. We didn't get the project based finance uh, tip. We did get a, a study of that that we hope that Senator Cummings was instrumental in getting in uh, the local option ability to to pass this local option task ta taxes. I uh, know it was also a priority that that didn't happen. So I'm I'm sorry that those. Things did not happen, but there are things that you know that we that we worked on, and that I think are, are difficult things that will come over time. Uh, I think us creating housing, we I think did make good progress statewide. Um, I was just asking fellow senators about 110 State Street, and if we were able to to help the city with the first right of refusal. I don't know if we are <laughs> able to get that one as, uh, either, but. Uh, hopefully that'll work out for the city, and we could continue to to work and work with BGS uh, on that effort. But um, I mean, th those were the uh, the priorities that I went through in my head, and 
you know, as you know, sorry to report that we didn't didn't meet those, but I want to let you know that we're aware of that, or at least that I am that, that need to work on that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I was, thank you. I was feeling um, uh, similarly. And so thank you for, um, for saying that, but there were, there were some other um, wins that I think are worth um, mentioning, uh, you know, lower down on the list of priorities is uh, uh, regarding banning PFAS. And there was a bill this year that um, banned PFAS in cosmetics and personal care products. Um, so again, that's like a, another step in the right direction. I need to follow up on where exactly that one landed. Um, did that make it across? Okay. Um, and then uh, just as far as like microtransit goes there, I think there was funding for more microtransit programs, not necessarily, I don't know if it was going to necessarily come to Montpelier, but it is an idea that has, um, that has caught on. People want, places want to uh, try this out based on uh, the success in Montpelier. And so um, we've got more funding for that. And then um, one of the other priorities was uh, uh, around expanding the, the net metering capacity for the city. And uh, there was actually a, a bill that uh, natural resources looked at that would have limited further limited uh, net metering. And so we did not move forward with that. Uh, so that um, the issues around net metering are gonna be studied uh, over the summer. So um, so the, there'll be more to say about that. But uh, coming back to dispatch, also um, one of the priorities, I mean, this is something that uh, both, uh, you know, city manager and mayor and I have, have, have talked about uh, previously, but, uh, you know, in spite of not being able to get uh, the previously uh, awarded money to you all, um, at least we've gotten to a place where uh, the state is going to be studying the issue of dispatch by collecting further data, and uh, and then there is this opportunity for uh, creating more uh, pilot uh, dispatch centers. And so my hope is that Montpelier will be able to be one of those pilot um, locations. So that's th those are a, a few high level things. There are, there are other um, things that may be worth mentioning. Um, uh, there, there was a, a household hazardous waste bill that uh, was signed that is gonna affect uh, how the um, Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District uh, pays for their uh, hazardous waste collection days. And so that should not um, come from the, the cities, but it's going to be paid for by the manufacturers of um, hazardous waste products. So um, that I think is a, a, going to be a good thing for us. Um, and then uh, uh, another one of the, the bills that I worked a lot on this uh, session was the Affordable Heat Act. So happy to answer any questions you have about that, but um, really that is going to design a program uh, and then there'll be multiple uh, studies that come back that'll tell us more about the uh, the cost implications. And then uh, there'll need to be another uh, bill in 2025 um, if we're going to choose to move forward. Thanks, Sam. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, freshman house rep. Uh... I got put on the uh, Corrections and Institutions Committee. Not always the sexiest committee. Um, you know, a lot of time in prisons and uh, you know, with the $200 million capital bill, which does have quite a bit of intersection with city government, you know, as you know, like we think about like, you know, lunchtime in Montpelier and how vibrant it used to be with state employees, window shopping and buying sandwiches. And sort of, uh, you know, filling up our stores in town. It's been pretty empty the last few years since the pandemic. We've gone to teleworking and we never really went back, right? I took a tour of the Waterbury State Complex a couple months ago. And, you know, it's a massive, sprawling building. But I would say one out of every 10 desks was full. And, you know, you talk to managers, you talk to the Commissioner of Human Resources, Commissioner of BGS. Productivity hasn't really gone down too much. People sort of like the hybrid model of going in a couple of days a week and otherwise working from home. But it's taken a very real and immediate toll on our city as far as, you know, economic um, issues here. So, um, you know, 
one thing on institutions, I've really been trying to reconcile that, you know, if we're, if we're not going to get people back to work in state government, you know, in our city, um, we got to look at the office space, right? And because we got a lot of empty buildings around Montpelier. And I, I've been taking walks, you know, just at lunchtime and seeing the empty parking lots, you know, behind some of the state buildings and thinking, God, that's a lot of potential, right? We should be building there. We should be building housing or something else, you know, um, just just for the sake of our city. So I think that's something we really got to stick with. Um, I was like a dog on a bone with 110 State Street in the Capitol bill and got some language from Montpelier to get right of first refusal, as Senator Perchlick said. Um, I think it's an interesting building. I think we could maybe like look at getting some apartment buildings in there um, if we were interested and we get a few months to think about it. Um, but, you know, like country clubs not coming on online anytime soon and we're in desperate need of housing. So we got to be creative, whether that look at like Baldwin Street, you know, some of those buildings for sale. Uh, so we'll keep looking. Um, public restroom, I introduced, that was my first bill, you know, as a bathroom guy, you know, in the state house, not too glamorous again. Um, I'm on institutions. It went to my committee. I, I'm sorry I didn't get it over the finish line. Uh, when you ask for a public restroom for Montpelier, every other city would like one as well. And I think that was part of the problem, kind of watered it down a bit. Um, I, I think there's maybe some creative ways we can look at, at tagging it on something, but talking to human service committee folks um, to see if we can draw it more into a uh, issue for the unhoused, you know, and, and put it there rather than try to prioritize Montpelier <laughs> above other communities for that. But, you know, we'll keep on it. Um, just introduced drafting for a project-based TIF as well. Um, I, I held off on it because we can only do short form bills this time of year and we'd like the full one. So hopefully get out that on the wall on house ways and means. Um, uh, other than that, like, okay, elephant in the room, Kate and I voted against the budget, right? We did that because $8.5 billion and, you know, just haven't been on council here, seeing the effect like homelessness had on our community. And the feeling like we're kind of drinking from a, a fire hose here. We're not a social service agency with the city. We're ill-equipped to deal with some of the issues facing us uh, with the unhoused. And I, I think, you know, when I was on council, we always tried our best, right? Uh, but it was never enough. It was never enough. And it's a regional or a statewide issue, and the state really needs to have some responsibility here. And so the thought of 3,000, almost 3,000 people uh, being exited within a month or two time frame um, it just seems me, untenable. Connor, just a second. Yep. Apparently, it's not go what you're saying isn't going out over the Zoom at the moment. I'll start from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was definitely the message. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. What crashed? Ah, uh, you're back. All good, yeah. Gary, you're nodding, you can hear now? Great. Okay. Yeah. You're good. So I, I, I think we need to be doing more as a state with the unhoused and, um, you know, just talk at the providers, folks who were unhoused in our community. Um, I think it's too much having that many people exit the motel voucher program at once. And, uh, you know, it becomes sort of a cost shift because if the, the state's not paying for it, communities are paying for it. And sure enough, we saw Montpelier is $425,000 in the budget for a warming shelter or something similar, you know, to be determined there. Um, I think Montpelier has been doing a lot with the homeless liaison position, the social worker position embedded into the police department, uh, having our own vouchers for adverse weather uh, when people weren't eligible for the, uh, for the state one. But, you know, just the thought of like, you know, the proposal from Barry having like 300 cots in an ice rink when we just passed an $8.5 billion budget. It's not enough and we need to do more. And I'm really happy that we are having conversations now uh, as part of the veto override session to possibly have a companion bill that would supplement some of what the budget did. Uh, knowing the reality on the ground here, this administration, we saw them come in, right? We saw the commissioners come in and make some promises to us about how the state was gonna step in and make it better. And they didn't fulfill those promises. So I don't trust the state 
for this administration to do it on their own. And I think the legislature needs to give them a nudge to actually fulfill this responsibility. So I'm hopeful when we get back next week, uh, we can have a bill that looks to reallocate funds in the budget uh, and steps in to have it more a gradual, humane transition from this program um, so that we can accommodate people because good things happen. You know, um, the hotel situation, it, it's not ideal. It, and I, th I think it can't exist in perpetuity. Uh, but I know like Rebecca's in there, I was hanging out with some of the good Sam folks up at the hotel. And you saw some real success stories, right? When you have time to work with folks. Um, I remember one woman coming in there, uh, Rebecca was there and it's like, ah, we'll say her name is Jean. Um, you know, it took, took three, four weeks, but we found Jean, like some family out in New Mexico. They got an in-law apartment. We can place her there. She's going to be safe. She doesn't need to sleep in a tent next week. Um, and that's, I think, what we need to be looking at doing on an ind individual basis and take care of people. So I hope we can get there. Um, so I'll wrap up with that. Well, great. Thank you. And I want to express, express my personal appreciation for everything you've done. I know you, it seems like you're kind of feeling bad. Well, you did, we didn't get done everything you wanted to get done. But those of us who go in the state house year after year, we know what it takes. And the, uh, I've spent more hours than I could ever add up uh, trying, fighting for things that never happened. And uh, and so I appreciate that you continue to do that. Now, any thoughts from members of the council to keep it? Uh, Lauren. Uh, thanks. Uh, grateful you're all here this evening and for your hard work. It's a very tough job and really appreciate you all raising your hands to do it for our community. Um, and I'm really grateful for a number of the bills you highlighted. I think the housing bill was huge. The child care bill is massive. Uh, the climate action, like all kinds of, there's a lot of great work. Um, I did want to speak for a moment on the homelessness issue and really appreciate um, what you all are bringing up tonight. You know, this has been something that I'm hearing a lot from constituents about, as I'm sure they're your constituents too, and you're, I'm sure, hearing the same things. Um, and, you know, as you've heard from our, our recent uh, council members, you know, we've been spending a ton of time in this room um, working on this. And, you know, I think what I'm hearing is that people really understand the hotel, pro the hotel program was never meant to last forever, but also seeing all the stories that Connor's referencing and, you know, hearing about people who are losing shelter, the people who lost shelter on June 1st, people are uh, coming online to lose shelter and really have no place to go. We know that even people with Section 8 housing vouchers are not able to find housing. And so it just is totally unacceptable that we are putting people out there and just giving them tents and wishing them luck. And so that you know failure on the administration end to actually help people and get them there. Um, you know, we've heard so many stories of how providing shelter has provided people with the stability to be able to address addiction issues, to get out of an abusive relationship, um, you know, people with children. So there's so many families that are, you know, part of this issue. Um, and, you know, by taking this tack um, that, you know, originally happened, we know that Montpelier and other communities are really left scrambling. And we've been hearing from our service providers, as you all know, for months and months and months that there is not the staff. There is not the shelter capacity. And so there's, you know, everyone is so stressed out and there's no good solutions. Um, so, you know, it was really disheartening to leave in May and feel like we we're choosing to create this huge crisis, um, you know, which, which I think is fundamentally different from, you know, kind of ongoing homelessness when people are already out on the street that feels so, they're so multifaceted and challenging. This people were, it, were sheltered and we're choosing to take that away. Um, you know, so I'm, First and foremost, concerned about um, the people in the program. Also, you know, really concerned about like local businesses and our community and tourism and all the things you know in Vermont as well. Um, you know, and increased emergency room visits, long-term mental health impacts. Like, there's so many things that come along with with doing this. Um, you know, I'm grateful for uh, Representative Casey. It would, takes a lot of courage to stand up and fight for something you really believe in. So grateful for that and heartened to hear that it sounds like people are really at the table now trying to solve this problem. And um, I just wanted to put in my strong request to all of you to really find a solution and look for how we can, you know, as you said, put the funding in so we can house people and help transition everyone to longer term uh, housing solutions. Thanks for letting me get on the soapbox for a minute. <laughs> Any other, Donna? 
I'll second what you said and pat yourselves in the back. But now I'm going to ask, can you share what's the biggest stumbling block? If the unhoused is not being understood statewide now, when is it going? What's going to take it? And what's going to take the legislative will to overcome the administration? What, what do we do? The biggest problem is money. Um, the motel program was funded with um, federal money and it's gone. And the state does not have, you know, even if we negotiated a better deal, which the administration probably should have in the first place, even if we cut it in half, it's $50 million. And I'm going to turn it to Andrew, who's on appropriations. But I know we tried to find that money. The one place I know we could find it is out of the Housing and Conservation Trust Fund, which wouldn't impact social services. But then we wouldn't have the housing to house people. You know, you get into this. If we don't build houses, then they're in motels forever. And trust me, motels. I mean, these people, they don't have refrigerators or, you know, nothing that you and I get in a motel for the fee. They're paying a lot more than I would choose to pay in most motels. Um, and they're not getting a microwave or a refrigerator or any way to prepare food unless they can find another way to obtain them. Um, it's money. And I haven't done a vote count, but the um, understanding seems to be that to override a veto in a time of high inflation and an awful lot of people are struggling to pay their rent and buy their groceries, and we have a significant number of Vermonters on fixed incomes, um, it would be very hard, probably impossible, to override a veto to do any kind of a major tax increase. No one ever lets me do my job and raise taxes, but um, that's that's pretty much where it is. The, the It's not the will. It's just coming up with a very large amount of money. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question, Donna. And what I would say is that, like what Connor said, the, mo the money is there, especially in the, we're still coming out of the pandemic with a pretty strong surpluses but the question i think what held up the legislature for doing it is they were worrying about next year and setting a precedent that we were going to just keep it going for forever and i don't want to see the hotels continue i'm very exactly. disappointed that all this time that they haven't taken the money applied it to more long term right so if all of this was caused by a irene storm what would the state do right and that's like that's a common thing that I hear from constituents. Like if there was a hurricane, we would house them, and and we, the question is, would we house them for forever, or would it? You know, those. I don't want to house them. I want to. It's actually because reason shelter comes first is that all these individuals yeah. can't start building their lives right. until they have that shelter. Right. So it's really about, and once they have that shelter. Then they can have the jobs. Yeah. They can be taxpayers, no. and they can do all these things. Totally agree. But so it's long-term shelter. Yeah, the money going to long-term shelter. And so, so since this was a money problem that Senator Cummings talks about, was the, the 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 large amount of money for a for a solution that people want to be a short-term solution. And that when you asked about what the holdup was, that was the holdup. And I think uh, the legislature was guilty of some. Well, one trusting administration that we shouldn't have of, of having a plan and being able to not, you know, not basically kick the, the, the these vulnerable people onto the streets. We were being told that wouldn't happen. I think we were also just hoping it wouldn't be as bad. Folks like Brenda that are here were telling us it was going to be bad, but I think uh, wanting to fund all the other needs that we have uh, in the state, we're thinking, well, we're, we're going to trust the administration. Uh, and we're going to hope that it's not going to be bad. I think things have changed. I think the thing that we're holding up has changed. So, you know, thanks to, to Connor and others that have, have really stood up on this, it has caused the conversation to change. And also, the the, the trusted administration is is gone that was there before. So, there was 
there was either hope or trust that no longer exists. So now the money that is there is going to be found at least to get through next year. But, but I predict we're going to have the same discussion next year. But in S100 and in other bills, we are putting a lot of money in towards housing. We will buy new motels to, to turn into you know, permanent housing or more shelters, but that'll take time. And so in the, in the meantime, how long can we keep the hotel program? How long can we, like the Connor said, find one at a time permanent housing and, and stability for these people? That's what we all want to do. And I, I think what we'll find next week, we'll, we'll find some way of at least doing it for one more year. I think, you know, we're now looking at affordable housing. We have put $300, $400 million into building affordable housing. And the housing bill required that towns allow density up to quadruplexes. Um, but we're looking at affordable housing. We need, we have a housing shortage across the board. And the um, distrust really between people who want to build housing and the environmentalists. Um, there's a real push push on both sides there. I think what we need is a state plan that says, this is where we have transportation. This is where we have services. This is where we build housing. Um, I've heard more than one story about people in Montpelier. Their rent went up $1,400. I've got an antique store that is no more. Um, I've lost my business because the rent went up, um, but the rents are going up, it's supply and demand. And if we aren't building some nicer apartments, then people with money are renting the apartments that people with less money used to rent. And so we've got to attack this on all levels and work together to kind of build up that trust so we can agree this is where it's appropriate to put housing and not nest, you know, you've got to have some ability to expand density. People with money will always have 10 acres and a McMansion, but there's a long way between an eighth of an acre and 10 acres. And I think we need to find a way to address that and um, work on it, communities and state together. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, in answer to your question, I, I think in addition to the bill that we anticipate uh, seeing perhaps next week, um, my guess is that we're going to have a lot more attention and scrutiny on the issue of homelessness going into next session. And so I think that's it's going to be elevated and prioritized. Um, by a lot of uh, legislators going into next session. So that that gives me some hope about um, finding a plan for the future. And, and maybe, it, maybe it looks different than the, the hotel voucher program that we have right now, but, um, but it might look, look similar, it, it, especially um, you know, in that we, we want you know, housing first for, for folks. And uh, one of the things that I do appreciate was that the state put out an RFP to communities to say, what are your ideas? Could, you know, can we fund, um, so, you know, some project that you want to do? And I uh, uh, appreciate that. I think it was, it came out um, too late, but I think that uh, has some, some merit as an approach because I, I think communities know what uh, the the best solutions for their community might be. And so I'd, I'd like to see um, that particular approach um, be potentially built up uh, that that could be a way for the state to help fund um, local projects. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm gonna be optimistic that we have a really good week next week. Uh, <laughs> had some good conversations with leadership, very respectful. Um, I think like everybody very well intentioned here. It's just different ways to get where we are. But you know, like the, the job of state government is to help people. And if we can't help people, we shouldn't hurt them, right? So if somebody has a roof over their heads right now, if you take that away, you know, bad things can happen. The one thing we have right now is sort of a captive 
you know, group of folks in the different hotels where we, we can get them the services they need if we direct them there. But once we, we hand them tents and they sort of disappear into the shadows of the bike path, you know, and into like Hubbard Park, um, you, you can't find them anymore and they're gone, right? So, um, you know, it, it was hard to vote against the budget because I, I agree, I think there's a lot of really good like mid and long-term solutions in that. Um, and I think we do need to invest in that. It's just like, how do we get there in the short term? The good news is like the federal money that was coming in, you know, was um, pretty strict, right? It, was, it, it actually created some barriers with negotiating with the hotels. The state money, we have a lot of flexibility and could do an RFP program there where you try to get those rates down to like 125 or 100 a night, you know? So, I mean, the bad news with that is, as Senator Cummings said, it's state money, right? It's not federal money anymore, uh, but we can be a little more nimble with it. So I think it is just, you know, trying to get through the next like year or the next few months here and make sure people have a, a better landing than they do have at the moment. So. Thanks, Carrie. I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, so I just want to thank all of you for the things that you, you were able to accomplish. Um, I do understand and know how hard it is to get anything done or to feel like you're really um, meeting the items on on uh, your agenda, much less somebody else's agenda. Um, it's it's hard not to to look at our Montpelier agenda and see how many things were not done or not addressed or are not priorities for for others. And and I think that that's um, I'd be interested in having sort of more in-depth conversations on a more regular basis as we kind of prepare for upcoming sessions to talk about what's what's realistic on, on our agenda, how we can align with priorities um, so that we can feel like like we're we're getting our needs met. And I I'm very, very grateful that there is this last minute look at the budget and trying to rethink, uh, the state's response to that end of the hotel program. Um, I really want to thank Representative Casey for being one of the people who I think gets a lot of credit for forcing this conversation right now. Um, I'm so grateful to you for that. And and then I, I guess I just want to um, I I want to say that you know we understand the issue about there not being enough money um, <laughs> because we don't have the money here in Montpelier, and so it's. I, I I know it's true, but it is discouraging to hear the the, the state who has more money than we do say well, we don't have the money, and just you know as everyone is just saying well we don't have the money. Um, so I would I would urge you to um, be creative and and brave in finding ways to raise the money and to prioritize it, and I would also urge you to be brave and strong in your dealings with the administration and that you have quite a bit of authority and can make some things happen. And I, and I, and I definitely hear that that is happening now. So I'm very encouraged about that. Um, and, and just, you know, one last thing I'll say as a state employee, they're not coming back. So <laughs> we shouldn't be wondering what to, whether or not those state employees are coming back. We're not coming back. So we should go ahead and move as, as aggressively as we, as we want to on reclaiming some of the space downtown. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Tim. Going, thank you. We're so happy our, our representatives at the state level. It's um, I'm fairly new here, and Connor's comment about drinking from a fire hose is, uh, I'm sure it's just a small sense of it here versus what you encounter at the state level. It, the, the, there's so many big issues, and, and prioritizing and getting something done is clearly, you're, you're making great steps forward. One little thing, it's not that little, but it's time sensitive. And we heard about it at a recent meeting and because you're all here, um, PFAS piece that Ann Watson mentioned. Um, so there's a, apparently an Act 250 application in for Casella and Coventry. And we're the only plant, I believe in Vermont, that's accepting the leachate from the Coventry landfill. Uh, right now that's flowing into our plant. And then because it is really fully treated going into the Winooski River and flowing north to all those Vermonters north of us who use Lake Champlain as a water source. Um, so anyway, this application's in play. If you have any ability to check on it or help boost it through Act 250 to build this filtration facility in Coventry that will treat this leachate before it comes to our plant, I think it would help a lot of people. And it's very time sensitive. I think we gave them about 60 days at our last meeting to get this permit in hand, or we won't be in a position to 
possibly extend the agreement to accept that leachate. So. We have it on our agenda for next month. Yep. Yeah. I, thank you. Um, Bill. Thank you all. And I know you've all heard from me a lot this year, so I'll try to stick to the, the main points. Start with some small things. Um, so this is probably more BGS. Uh, I think in, as a general policy, we've talked about this. If if a, if the state is disposing of land in a municipality, just it shouldn't have to take a special. It ought to be the, the the local government should always have for right of first refusal. I just think that just makes good sense, and it ought to be institutionalized. It shouldn't have to chase this down building by building, lot by lot. Secondly, um, we all agree that housing is a key priority. Um, but again, I think some of the silos, we just heard this week about a person who's trying to potentially develop housing on Baldwin Street to buy one of the buildings on Baldwin Street. And one of the problems they're running into is parking. And the state was like, we don't lease parking to non-state use, private uses. So the state's trying to sell buildings which will create housing units that don't exist during a housing crisis and the state won't let them use state parking to develop the housing. So it's it's kind of like, what's going on here? Is, are we in a crisis or aren't we? And particularly if we're not going to be using the parking. We've talked about, re, I mean, this would be using parking for parking, but it would, it would be an ancillary use to developing housing. And, and that just seems to me like a totally missed mark. Um, uh, what was the next one? No, I think that was, that was it. So that moves on to, we have had a lot of local discussion about, uh, what to do about housing crisis and the use of state properties in short and long term. You've mentioned that there are these huge unused properties, uh, Waterbury and in Montpelier. Even in the short term, if you think of things like pallet housing, which is not certainly not a permanent solution, but there are vast parking lots in, in Waterbury in here that could be used to set these things up in the short term uh, and, and you know to provide some more relief for people. Uh, so I think, uh, again, we've pushed AHS to talk about use of state, even some of these state buildings, maybe they could get converted to housing. Um, but we've pushed AHS and they've sort of said, well, that's BGS and that's ACC, you know. So I think, I, I don't know where the singular focus is on, we have a housing crisis. Um, so there's that. A uh, couple of things with the housing bill. Um, Appreciate what you did. Uh, I'm sure you've already heard this from me and others, but uh, Montpelier and most of the cities in the state already do everything that you required for the zoning. That we have to actually make no changes to our zoning because of S100. So there's nothing in that bill that's going to create any more housing in Montpelier and in Burlington and in Brattleboro and in Barrie and in every place else. So yes, in the rural countrysides, it might. Um, and then the increase from 10 to 25 units was great. But if we're talking about building affordable housing and talking about having economies of scale, we need to be able to build more than 25 units, um, you know, without active 50 regulation and all that. So I know you know this. I'm just saying it out loud for all to hear. Um, we appreciate what you did do. It, 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 I would be shocked if there's any housing that's actually built as a result of this bill. Um, Next thing, uh, we talked about some of having good vibes going to the next session, and that's great. That is not until January and won't be done until next May. So for folks that need a place to be, that's a lot of uncertainty for a long period of time. And I think something to really keep in mind when we talk about short term and long term, and, and I'm not trying to be negative, I just think it's really important, is that for, housing needs to be created, but it's not going to happen in a year. We all know how long it takes to get a project done. It's got to, you've got to secure the financing, you've got to secure permits, you've got to find the land, you've got to find people willing to do it. We're talking a two to three year period here. This is not going to be like suddenly everyone's got housing next January or next May. So when we think about these interim solutions, it's got to be not, I mean, short term has to maybe be a longer term than what has been considered short term. Uh, and lastly, I think the thing on the local funding, yeah, and you're right, the, the local funding was great. At least from our perspective, a lot of that is for short term interim solutions. It's not really to create local projects. So we've, we've convened a team of all the nonprofits and the local governments, 
and we are looking at what needs are, and they are things like more shelter space, maybe more pallets, you know, those kinds of more, more outreach workers dealing with people. It's not going to create um, permanent housing. So it's absolutely responding to the need. Um, so that's, sorry, but I, we've really been way into it here preparing, and I, I am glad to hear that maybe uh, it will be delayed because, you know, I think we've all been gearing up for an emergency. And then just lastly, we really need project-based TIF. <laughs> and we, more, more on that later. Mm -hmm. that, so. Okay. Um, any other members of the council before I uh, go to the members of the public? Okay. We've got members of the public. Why don't you step up? Thank our entire delegation. Could you get right up to the microphone, Sorry. Barbarina. Okay, is that working? I think that's okay. working. You they really have to be right really there. on top of it to make right it there. work. Yeah. Okay, Barbarina Hiredal. I live here in Montpelier. I want to thank our entire delegation for all the work you've done this session, and also for being good sports for being in communication with me because I do feel passionately about this housing issue. I have no fancy credentials. I just grew up in New York City at the beginning of its epic homelessness crisis. My youngest son went to college in New York City. I visited over the past 30 years. When communities don't address homelessness, it just becomes unbelievably tragic. And I was so heartened to read three stories this morning about a tentative deal that's been brokered to not evict more people starting on July 1st, but I'm going to beg of you that you make whole the people who are evicted on June 1st and the people who are about to be evicted tomorrow from the very motels. Thanks to the work of Brenda Siegel, as well as many reporters, I read a story which was particularly personal for me about a woman in her 70s who had a hip replacement on May 23rd, who was evicted on June 1st. I was born handicapped and needed a complete hip replacement at the age of 44. I was very healthy at the time. I was comparatively young. I had great post-op care. I can't imagine what it would have been like to navigate post hip replacement living on the sidewalk without a bed, without a toilet, without a place to shower, without a place to wash my hands. I talked with a friend of mine who's a nurse. This is an absolute recipe for post-op infection and for her to fall and dislocate her hip. I know there was some sort of arcane kind of gilded age metrics of their deserving poor and their undeserving poor and only the undeserving poor were going to be evicted, but it didn't work. I heard about an amputee who was evicted, a vet with a collapsed lung. They weren't responsible for the housing crisis. Their big crime is they don't have money to pay rent. I'm just begging you, make those people whole. It just, I don't believe this is what Vermont is, that we kick people out this vulnerable and say, well, you didn't fit the 47 different criteria. The points didn't quite land up. And from you, Andy, I've heard there is a way to access the money, the reserves that have been earmarked for matching funds in 2025. I understand those could be very important projects, but these are our fellow Vermonters. They're trying to figure out how to live with the most basic things we take for granted. One of my best friends also is an abortion provider at Planned Parenthood, and she and I just were talking about last night. All of the women I've been hearing about who are in the motel program because they're escaping domestic violence, the likelihood that one or more of them needs an abortion, and trying to imagine what is it like to navigate a pharmaceutical abortion on the sidewalk? Without the sanctuary of walls, a ceiling, a door that locks, a toilet, a shower, a kettle where you can heat water. So I'm just begging you. You have an $8.5 billion budget. Please figure out a way to make whole the people that the state has harmed. And there are more people in the pipeline that are supposed to be evicted tomorrow. Thanks so much, Barbara. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Brenda Siegel. I'm from Newfane, Vermont. Um, I am grateful to all of you for being here and being willing to face 
conversation and criticism. Um, and Andy, I've criticized a lot. And <laughs> in this conversation about homelessness, um, but I want to talk a little bit about what I saw and the 15 witnesses across the state on June 1st, who um, I organized to be at the hotels. Um, we heard about the person with a collapsed lung and had an aneurysm. I was there at that hotel. Um, we heard about a 72-year-old man who was miscategorized. I helped him get shelter and then moved him again the next day and then moved him again two weeks later. I, we heard, there was a young woman in Colchester who uh, did not meet any of the, does not meet any of the archaic J GA qualifications. And she is alone right now in a tent in Virgins under a bridge. And she has never been homeless before. There is the person we just heard about who just had hip surgery. There are a number of people who have bipolar. There was a woman who was anorexic, who was miscategorized, and we had to work to get her brought back in. And I could go on and on about June 1st stories, but now I wanna tell you about Friday. The exits are Friday, it was a little confusing. Um, from the hotel owners that were willing to renegotiate to have two weeks, which they gave without being paid grace period, which made it a little easier for service providers and gave these folks a little more time to pack their stuff. But I wanna tell you a little bit about them. Um, 37 of the people that I interviewed across the state, that was 70, I interviewed 77 of the 90 that are about to be exited. 37 um, entered some form of recovery while they were in the hotel program and are in it right now. Four reported struggling, but wanted to be connected to services. And one reported struggling and did not feel they could be connected to services when they were about to lose their housing. 10 were escaping domestic violence and could not jump through the hurdles that the GA program rules require. And so several of them were considering going back to their abusive partners. Medical conditions include people with diabetes, recent surgeries, needed surgeries, liver trans, someone who needs a liver transplant, two active cancers, people with brain surgery, brain tumors, and more conditions. Several people reported suffering from mental illness, including bipolar, and the, many of these are in this community, in this county, um, bipolar, agoraphobia, multiple personality disorder, and I can go on. Um, many reported being employed. Almost 30% reported being employed. And another 15% reported actively looking for work and being told over and over again that because of their looming lack of address, they were not going to be hired at those jobs. Others are in the process of applying for SSDI, but as many know, that's sometimes a three-time process. Many were illegally evicted and so can't prove their eviction status. 100% um, of the people I interviewed did not have somewhere to go, although we have now found a place for two of the people, but that's only two. 100% of the people that we interviewed did, uh, did not know where they're allowed to camp. And several said not where they can find camping, but where they're allowed to. And several said they would not survive on the street. Several women reported being... Yeah. No, I'm okay. sorry to interrupt you, but okay. I'll, I'm sorry. I don't know who you're <laughs> trying to figure out where the sound is. Okay. So the last thing that I want to say is that several women are are afraid of rape, actively afraid of rape, and I'm asking you to not only make whole the 900 people that will be exited by the end of this week, but also keep this program open for the people who are going to be on oxygen and all the people who are going to actively need shelter when v as VRAP is ending. We can't just talk about the people that are currently in the shelter. So please, please consider that. I begged you during the session. I begged every one of you during the session. Please okay. listen to us now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda. Hi. Hi, I am Rebecca Dupree. And and you, could, and you could you step right up to the microphone again? Yes. Sorry. I am Rebecca Dupree, and I am actually in the hotel motel program um, with my two children. I am at the Hilltop um, for the past few months. I have been advocating statewide. I have been going to all of these hotels as well. And I have been meeting and speaking with the individuals that are also utilizing this program. I have been transcribing the letters. I have been sending them out um, across to all the legislature. Um, throughout the session and 
currently it's it is a difficult it's really a difficult thing to have to take in um being that the housing isn't available the affordability um it's there's so many barriers in the way of finding the stability in permanent housing um i have two children i do 10 15 applications a week to apartments top of the state all the way to the bottom of the state um and i haven't found anything i am one i have a house choosing voucher through vermont state housing authority i fight monthly to keep extending that so that i don't lose it if we lose that voucher we are completely we're just in trouble um things will be that much worse a lot of people are losing their vouchers because they can't find the housing um people are in panic mode there's people they are crying they are begging for help nobody knows where to go nobody knows what to do and i think that's putting a pause on on their progress not alone just from the state kicking people out um and of course these being people that have made incredible amounts large strides in progress whether it's their recovery their physical health their mental health or their own personal growth in whatever way with this unsheltering and ending this program everybody that has moved so far forward is being thrown right back to where it is that they had started from um being one that does utilize this program and is in one of the hotels i can say that no it is not the grandest plan um and it's not like a long term solution it really isn't but it is something that has kept thousands of people stable for such a long time they have been able to make huge improvements in their lives and it's something that needs to continue until something can be put into place something transitional something that can become permanent putting people out to the streets it's it's not okay it's 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 inconceivable um to do such a thing and i'm sorry but i it's something that i live so i have i have this connection with all of these people across the state and it's just it's the reality of of the life in these hotels. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, thanks for doing this. I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Uh, I want to encourage, especially the legislators who could really liaison with the negotiators of that new bill. I'd take a look at the regional dispatch bill and that model of having communities identify potential land that could serve as an interim uh, sites with water and sewer uh, for soft housing. Bill, you aptly pointed out that, that this is gonna take years to get the housing built to solve this problem. So we need interim solutions and the current model of the, you know, whatever the pods are that Burlington did, they look and feel like jail cells. They're in compounded fenced yards where no visitors are allowed. It's, it's not a, it's a concentration or a internment camp model. We need to work on identifying Peace Park, Hubbard Park, Gateway Park, Home, uh, home Farm Road, Elks Club property, and, and figure out what's appropriate scale and capacity of each, which ones would require pump out of water and sewer trailers. But this is a failure of planning. This is the similar to the bathroom effort that Connor put forward. It's it's a failure of planning. BGS was willing to contribute to finance to keep the bathrooms open in the transit center as they do with the truck stop up at the top of the hill. It's the failure of planning on the state level. Regional planning or multi-municipal planning is the scale at which this can be done properly. So I would require in this bill you're negotiating for next week, require something like the public safety dispatch, inventory process for land, site, water, sewer, electricity, uh, bus service, you know, do that inventory and then we can prioritize where we could quickly put two, four, six, eight, ten at a piece. 
and hire managers at $25, $30 an hour to keep and have one struggle you'll deal with is who has the right to eject someone if it's public property, because you can't allow all the heavy alcoholic users to congregate at one, and you can't allow the junkies and the dealers to congregate at one. You need to have the ability to creatively allow the site managers to collaborate on where the people best fit. So, Thanks, Steve. There's some good points there. Rick. Uh, hi, uh, Rick DeAngelis. I uh, live in Montpelier, and I'm also the director of the Good Samaritan Haven. And, um, you know, I didn't come here tonight expecting that I would say something very positive and hopeful, but I feel like doing that right now. And, uh, you know, I've been working in housing my entire career, long, long time. And um, I have to say, I, I'm really, I've never seen anything quite like the awareness today of uh, of a problem of poverty and housing. I mean, look at it even here tonight. I mean, the members of the public, the legislature, the council, everybody is aware of this problem, is thinking about it and trying to find solutions. And, um, you know, uh, and in a very practical level, uh, over the last two months, we've been meeting with uh, city officials. Bill has been great at organizing that uh, from Barry and Berlin and Montpelier and brainstorming and coming up with things that we can actually do to make a difference. So I guess the way that I'm trying to look at this is that maybe this is a point in time where we're actually going to turn a corner and begin to really address a very vexing and challenging problem in a very fundamental way. So uh, that's what I'm hopeful for. So I, you know, I appreciate the tough job our legislators have and, and thank you for, you know, for going at it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Rick. Um, I don't think I see anyone else in the room seeking to be recognized. Oh, okay, come on up, Nolan, sorry. Nolan Carver, Ward 1 Montpelier. Um, you know, after the pandemic and during the pandemic, I realized that the value of life here in Montpelier comes back to human beings. When Main Street was empty, I acknowledge every passing by human being, and we were all equals in that moment. Well, as it turns out, throughout history, from time to time, our society deteriorates, corrupts. In some way, the people suffer and struggle. Um, we are considering political and economic solutions to essentially a humanitarian crisis. I simply am here to remind you all, as a Vermonter and as a strong Vermonter in a strong tradition, um, we are, after all, equals um, human beings. And if this crisis could uh, educate us in one, at least one, one way. Um, it, it would, to me, point to the fact of a really profound question. Um, do we value each other? Are we able to care uh, for one another? Hmm? Um, and are we willing, you know, to be uh, humane? Um, I look around and I see um, this uh, divisiveness and um, these controversies play out. Um, where where is the humanity? And and if we can if we can you know look there, I, I think if we look there into the heart of things, um, I, I think that will be the long term solution uh, to our um, existential crisis crisis and crises. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm not seeing anyone else in the room seeking to be recognized. Um, if there's anyone on Zoom who's not uh, had a chance to speak and would like to rec be recognized, please whip on your hands up uh, button. Okay, I am not seeing anybody. Um, 
thanks so much for being here. It's uh, I appreciate coming out. You're coming out knowing that you were not everything you're going to be here hearing was, would be totally complimentary, and I uh, totally appreciate that, uh, Donna. Us maybe to help gather supporters when you need them at the state house or you need letters written. We, you know, we can help you too. Okay. Yeah, I I I got a chance to testify on uh, on the housing bill and. Uh, I appreciated that opportunity. We we want to work with you. And I think it's not just us. It is also the executive branch. Um, we believe them when they told us they had an all hands on deck plan to deal with this and it has not materialized. We can put forth every bill we want next week, but if it gets vetoed, I don't know where we go. We, if we do not have a budget by July 1st, our understanding and in the first year of this governor's term, um, his first term, we went till June 28th before we got a budget signed. If we, at that point we were told, and there's, it's a constitutional interpretation thing, but basically if we do not appropriate the money, there's no continuation of essential services. State government shuts down July 1st. So that's kind of the box that we're in. Um, this administration doesn't talk to us a whole lot. They just wait till the end and they veto and we're here. And it is very difficult and very frustrating. So talk to us, but also talk to the administration and let them know that this, you know, they get voted for too. Um, mm -hmm. Let them know that this is, this is really what Vermont wants um, and turn the conversation around other than state government spending too much money. Yep. Great. Uh, one, right. of my, one of my last comment on the state buildings, like 110 State Street, if you did want to turn in housing, the problem is there's no parking. So it goes to your point, Bill, like where would the parking be? So I think it is something that we need to work with of saying all that parking that's behind there, that's not being used because the state workers aren't showing up. The state should be required to use some of those parkings to go with 110. Because right now I think there's two spots that go with 110 State Street. So it would be difficult. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> or, or the whole lot. Well, we have somebody on institution, so we're all set. <laughs> the city does not control, and there, there is a whole system for setting up the rules. So I think we should look into finding out who really does make those decisions. Is it the legislature, or is it what is it called? The Capital the Complex Commission. Capital Complex Commission. I think they make a lot of those rules, and we. We need to check. Well, I know they do a lot with the design. Yeah, our ownership. Our ownership. So we have to look into that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All those lovely, lovely. Um, if I can add one thing, I just want to say that I, I heard uh, Councillor Brown on uh, having more frequent and in-depth conversations. And so, um, you know, if or when you want to schedule another time to um, to to chat, um, certainly open. Welcome to do that. Great. Come Thanks. Us. Uh, during the session, there oh, was yeah. a time where um, there was somebody from the city there every Tuesday morning at eight o'clock. Um, I was one of them. Um, but that was a time to catch your, your representatives before they got so bogged down in committee. And, and that's helpful because maybe Representative Casey just has you, but we had 13, 14, 15, I think we have 16 towns now we represent in the Senate. That's a lot of local meetings to get to. Thank okay, you. thanks folks. This has been Thank great. Um, I think that uh, it's a little bit early for it, but I think this will be a time for us to take our 10 minute break and we'll reconvene at 8.20. Hi folks, I'm Ward Joyce, I'm the chair of the Montpelier Public Arts Commission. I have been for nearly two years. It's a small commission, and so that's why I haven't necessarily been replaced 
but we are working effectively. And so we've just kept our officers in place. The, the reason that I'm here today is to make sure you understand what we're doing as a commission, because you, you may not, we haven't, I haven't come and talked to you. So what I'm going to go through is a collection of the work that we've done in the last couple of years. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to give us the ability to, to have a budget that we can spend from without having to come back to you all the time. So a limited set of buckets that we can spend money in, in, in ways that I'll explain. Down. <clears throat> okay, so the goals for the meeting is to familiarize you with what we're doing, discuss our operating budget, show you our recent accomplishments and present our work plan for next year. Um, in the process, we'd like to seek the council's authorization to spend from four specific budgets um, that'll all be within the amount of money that we already have in our coffers. We're technically asked to come before you to spend anything. And if we can actually get authorization to have four buckets of spending from you, then we would be able to spend within those. And I think that would be easier. So the, the categories that we'd like to spend money from is maintenance of pieces, installation of signage at existing pieces. We want to commission two to four new murals at the Gateway Park, which is opposite the cemetery. And we would like to commission a large piece at the Transit Center, which got built about five years ago. The front room is an absolutely empty room with two big walls, and we'd like to commission an Abenaki piece for that this uh, winter. And then we'd like to have a, a, a fifth budget, which is to commission new projects. So we're asking for the ability to the pre-approval to use 16,000 of the $25,000 that we have in our operating budget. I'm not gonna read all these, but these are my, my ability to remember what I came here to talk to you about. So um, this is the commission's priorities as defined in the city charter. And I'm not gonna go through all these, but it's, it's our goal to, to commission and maintain public art within the city and to raise funds to do it. So we not only have to commission it, but we're also responsible for maintaining it, which is why one of our budgets that we asked for was for the maintenance of work. So the members of the Art Commission are um, recently Monica Giovanni, D. Giovanni resigned. So the rest of the folks on the upper list are still on the commission. Um, Josh Jerome is shown there, but he's a city rep. So it's interesting, we were founded, um, sorry, with, it was after the um, public arts master planning in 2020. And the master plan called for the city to give us $50,000 a year to commission and maintain public art. And in the four subsequent years, we've been given 20, 15, zero, and 10. So in four straight years, we've received um, less than one quarter of what we were anticipated. So we have $26,000 currently. And so we've spent 25 or 20. Uh, these are the projects we did in 2023, and I'm going to show you some images of them, so I'll skip over it. Um, so the largest piece that we did last year was on the side of Shaw's. <clears throat> and what's significant about this project was we only spent $5,000, but we did a $20,000 piece. Um, both Mr. Um, who's the owner of Shaw's? Pomerlo, thank you very much, Tim. Mr. Pomerlo gave $10,000 and Shaw's contributed money. The city put in some money, but the Art Commission, and we raised $10,000 of private funds. So our goal as the Art Commission is to try to leverage the public in investment and to partner with them. So this very big piece, 150 feet long, was commissioned with only $5,000 of public money. We had 55 submissions from around the world for this. And we chose a very talented artist out of Milwaukee who came in and did the piece. Out at the Gateway Park, which is opposite the cemetery, you know, if you're driving out to the Dairy Queen, there's like 21 pylons. And we got the state's permission to paint as many as we can manage to do over the next five years. 
Carolyn Shapiro and the Cemetery Commission collaborated with us on this piece. And two were done last year, and we're hoping to do two more this summer. We um, gave $1,000 to a Barry granite sculptor who um, donated this piece and brought it to the high school. We provided $1,000 just for the installation. I presume you saw the red oculus, which we gave, I think, $500 and located this here. It got public input and, is be and became then a video um, salon last winter. This fabulous mural was put on the back of the rec center. It was done with high school students. Again, very low cost piece. And in the art studio at the high school, five students painted this piece and then we installed it. So again, a very inexpensive piece that has replaced a 20 year old mural on the back of the building. And it's way prettier than this photograph. It's a very strong piece. Another piece that we supported was a video um, presentation on buildings and Montpelier Alive and the Art Commission together purchased a projector. So this is an ongoing project. I'm sorry for the, um, the piece that jumps in the middle of all the photographs, but I think you can see around it. Um, we also identified the need to move the Challenger Memorial from the bottom of the Life National Life Drive, and we brought it to the grounds of the high school, and we paid for the, uh, the reinstallation of that, or we, we took charge of it, but I think actually National Life contributed the money, so we just simply coordinated the project. We also commissioned three uh, inexpensive murals. The two on the right were done on, on canvases that we hung, and the one on the left was painted on a building. These were each about $500 pieces. So one of the themes that I hope you're gathering is that we've been using our $20,000 very judiciously and trying to commission impactful work that wasn't extremely expensive. So these are all, the two on the right are temporary because they're up on canvases. The one on the left is permanent. I'm on the side of Shippy. And then we also gave a commission for what we call the screens, which became vandalized and faded. And so recently, Montpelier High School art students again painted 10 panels that we just reinstalled there. So the commissioners not only coordinated it, paid for the cost of the projects, but then we went out and installed the work. And I presume most of you have seen it because the pieces are really quite fun. Um, those We just hung those last week. The other piece that we're working on right now is we intend to buy this three um, clothespin piece and we're seeking for a place to install it. So we're coordinating the installation. It's a $20,000 piece, but the money has been raised from the Rotary Club and Montpelier Alive has helped us. And we may not have to contribute any public money, but we're coordinating what will be a, a pretty large scale permanent installation um, we were hoping to put it next to Shaw's. We're still working on that. Okay, I got through that very quickly. So in conclusion, of the $26,000 that we have at our disposal, we would we seek your pre-approval to have those five buckets of expenditures so our commission can continue to judiciously commission, maintain, and put signage on artworks around the city. And if I don't have another image, no, I don't. So that's it. So I'd be happy to answer, answer any questions about the work we do or about the, my request, our request to have some spending, spending latitude with our budget. Great. Thank you. You're um, welcome. First off, great job of leveraging our money with uh, money from other sources. It really uh, makes a difference because, as you know, we have not always been able to appropriate the money that we would like to appropriate. Um, I should point out uh, that the sculpture in front of the high school was done by Montpelier High School graduate Sean Williams. And uh, <clears throat> last summer and this summer, he was and is the sculptor in residence at the St. Gaudens National Historic Site over in New Hampshire. Um, also, I'm hearing a lot of a lot of great comments about the the new uh, panels. Uh, 
next door to Shaw's. It's, Thank uh, you. People yeah. are definitely noticing that. Yeah. Um, now, could you talk a little bit about the uh, the public participation and how you go about doing that? Because you know, we we've heard about that in in, in, in times past in, in that uh, piece particularly. No, just in, in general. What do you? How, how do you elicit public uh, participation? Well, it's 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 our responsibility when every piece comes up to to try to reach out and get um, broad public participation. So we've generally the RFPs we have out right now. We're going through the Vermont State Arts Council. We're publishing them on seven days and in Times Argus, and we're trying to get multiple um, applicants for every piece. So we do it that way. For Shaw's, we we built a commission of some community members and Shaw's and the Art Commission and Montpelier Alive. And we did a jury in which we debated and talked about the work on many on many um, levels. And so not only do we try to bring people in, but also the evaluation of the pieces we try to make by a committee. Okay, thanks. Any other members of the council, Donna? So do you have any public involvement when you are, are having an RFP response? Do you have public come and actually hear that presentation and share in their opinions? Or I don't think we've done that as broadly as say the when they did the turntable at the at the center, that was a very, very public commission with public meetings. And I think that would be that would be great. The biggest piece we've done so far was Shaw's. And we had six or seven people as part of the group. That evaluated it, so there were some Montpelier Live people. So I don't think we've gotten to the place where we've we haven't commissioned anything really significant or permanent, except for Shaw's. And so if we like, for instance, the um, clothespin piece, um, because that was done out at the um, um, ta uh, I want to say Taft's Corners, but the old uh, the Arts Center out in in Callis, it was um, what's that called? Kent Museum? Kent's Museum, yeah. It was done for that. And the commission just felt it was a strong piece because it related to the clothespin history. And we actually asked the artists whether we could buy it from them and install it. So it, on some things, the commission sort of acts out of our, in our own judgment about what is good stuff. And other times, like for the mural park out by under the interstate, We've put out an RFP for with a two month period of time, and we're hoping people will respond to it from the public. Um, so. Well, it was really, I mean, I, I do, I'm very impressed with what your response is from your RFPs for the projects. But when you did the turntable at the transit center, those projects that came in when you were making that decision that presented in here, was incredible to experience. Yeah. It was a whole different understanding of the project as far as I was concerned. And maybe I've missed it. Maybe it's posted with your minutes online that you're coming up and you're having people come in to be interviewed. But I I would like some of that to be more public. Yeah, that's I mean, a great you're idea. still making your decision, but maybe sometimes just it, it educates all of us. That's yeah. All. No, it makes great. it more important. For right. everybody. Yep. I'll you know, bring, each I'll, a little support group going. Yeah. No, I'll bring that back. I'll bring that back yeah. to the group as a, a, a way of um it is it's public engagement. It actually yeah. extends the value of what we do. Yes. Ooh. Appreciation yeah. and praise. <laughs> you know, we're um yeah, we're um um yeah, we're yeah. yes, I, I don't say it to be a a weighted responsibility. I say it to to have your own cheering group, right. really. No, no, I agree. I yeah. think that's a great, great point, Donna. Thank you. Uh, Tim. I think one. Of course, Tim. It's exciting. I think so. The transit center piece was one that is probably a good example of the maintenance in this budget you're proposing because that one, I'd love to see it moved out and be more accessible. I think it gets hidden and lost where it was installed, and people are not using it or enjoying it. It's, it's actually I tried turning it. You can't even turn it right no, now. No, I. You're like a gorilla. Yeah. With that. Man. So that that piece, other ones like a couple other pieces is the arts commission involved in um, like the mural on the parking lot at 60 state. Um, that Interestingly, that's a Montpelier Alive piece. Okay. The Montpelier Alive has a design committee yeah. and Katie's here. I think she, she was here. <laughs> um, okay. 
And Montpelier Live has taken a new um, liking for public art. So we're actually finding that we're both working on that. But that's really a Rob Hitzig piece, the 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 um, mm -hmm. parking lot. Parking lot, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I'd like to think I'd, I'd, it's the city, it's yours. The 50 at least, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to think that we're creating a bit of a movement. You know, I mean, I spent yeah. some time doing parklets and we got a parklet program and Rob painted a parking lot. And so our goal is to ride the kind of momentum that we've developed as a city in, in, yeah. in art. And so we're trying sensitively to find the best buildings, find the best places. Painting a parking lot is really just as good as a building, except it wears down quicker. And so we're, we're sampling and we're trying to learn. And we're trying to adjust. Like I can, the piece at the at the transit center. I think there's plenty of room to talk about ways that it might have been different, and we're going to learn from that. I don't think we would do that again. So, every every one is perhaps a learning experience. Yeah, thanks. And if we don't spend, <clears throat> sorry about my throat. If we don't spend a lot of money on each one, then we can learn from it without having invested too much. want to talk they should go ahead go ahead if anyone want to talk wants to talk they okay. can still talk i want to make a motion that we approve the sixteen thousand dollars as listed here in the five pockets okay um so any member of the public who wishes to address this and uh and carrie you're you're still here i don't know if you have any comment you'd like to make all right, if we're ready to vote, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And is anyone opposed? Okay, it's it's approved. Thank Thanks you so for much. coming in. Yeah, appreciate your time. <clears throat> I got it, I know that. <laughs> I enjoy coming here. <laughs> He's got 10 more thousand to spend. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we're up now to item number 10, the budget for the downtown improvement district and perfect segue. Yes, mine says number 10 on one version and 11 on another version. So, so welcome Katie. Hello everybody, you can hear me fine. Yep. Um, so this is my first time at this, so feel free to ask questions or if I forgot to include something that you need to know about, let me know. Um, I also included, I believe you have a copy of uh, the budgets from 22 and 23 um, and how they compare. So I'm gonna give a short presentation uh, so you know what to expect for this upcoming year and you can see some reflections on previous years. And for anyone who doesn't know you, could you mention your name? My name, yeah. Katie Trouts, and I'm the new executive director for Montpelier Alive. Um, and I just wanted to point out that there are no major changes in the um, budget from fiscal year 2022 to 2023, but there are just there's just a little bit of shifting of funds, um, as I'll point out in the presentation. Um, in part because we finished a huge project that much of 2020, 2022's funds went towards, which was our new website. Um, I believe last year there was 14,000 allocated for that, and now it is complete. So I've moved that money around a little bit in the budget for this coming year. Um, here we have uh, just a general idea of the types of things that Montpelier Alive does for our community, um, supporting businesses as they grow and change. This is the new partner, Maddie, at Splash, um, and they are expanding into Guitar Sam's space in downtown. Um, we support our businesses in many different ways um, to make for a vibrant downtown. And here we have the flowers this year, uh, three of our volunteers who have been doing this for a very long time, uh, beautifying our downtown. Um, it's really stunning every time those flowers come out. 
it's a major indication of change of season. Whoops, I meant not to do that, but that was all species day at the bottom. Um, we support events and that's what some of the CID funding goes towards as well. And all species day is one of those events that really defines our identity here in Montpelier. And um, we love supporting uh, events like that, um, bringing community together and, and strengthening our community and bringing visitors to downtown. Um, here, I'm just demonstrating the marketing in 2022. Uh, we moved 35,000 into marketing. And here I'm moving a little bit more in the direction towards beautification. And that's the change that you see here. And that's in part because we completed that website, that major project. But in marketing, um, you'll also notice that just at the beginning of this year, we launched a new adventure website I hope that you visit both of these websites, the MontpelierAlive.com, and then the new one, which you can link to from MontpelierAlive.com, but you can also find it here, adventure.montpelieralive.com. And um, it demonstrates our, our deep connection with the outdoors and outdoor rec and how that growing industry is affecting downtowns um, across Vermont. And we are jumping on board with that by having this new website and pushing a lot of uh, traffic there, visual traffic there, um, to find out about our wonderful resources here, include, including the new mountain bike trails. So um, we, we have finished that, but the new website and the adventure site do need some improvements. So we will be um, funding that uh, a little bit, much less than last year. And our tourism brochure, which is a, a really nice brochure that was put together a couple of years ago, uh, we will need to reprint and restock those, and those go across Vermont um, in welcome centers and visitor centers in um, strategic locations, including the Burlington Airport. Um, and then one of the goals that I've had is to increase our reach uh, beyond the border. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to connect with Canada and Quebec. So our out-of-state marketing, um, I put a little bit more into that um, category uh, than than last year in hopes of making that connection. And um, specifically Vermont Public, we're collaborating with them uh, and they do reach into Quebec quite a lot. Uh, so we're talking with them about how we can do that more as well as Boston, which is something we usually try to do um, is bring people up from Boston. Oops, we did that. I'm going backwards. How do I go forwards? <gasps> huh? Down there. Oh, okay. I have a Mac and this is a PC. There we go. Um, this, I, I believe you've seen before, but this is what guides our marketing. Um, we did a market research study a couple of years ago, uh, and this is what really informed our outdoor site as well. Uh, what people enjoy doing here, seasonal activities, outdoor activities. And we also uh, take many moments to celebrate our culinary scene, uh, which is a part of our marketing um, across the board. Uh, and we see that we draw a lot of visitors um, and, and people relocating here who are uh, 61 plus range uh, in terms of age. And uh, I believe that shows us that we need to be marketing towards that, but also uh, complementing that with um, some outreach towards younger audiences. Uh, so that's been a focus as well. All along it has, and we wanna continue that. These are a few accolades we've received. Um, number one, best small town for shopping and best Northeastern small town to visit, uh, largely in part of, of the efforts that we've put into our marketing. Um, for Montpelier, and this is by USA Today, 10 best competition, which is a, a national vote. No, I don't want to sign out. <laughs> I don't think I pressed that. Sign out. Okay. That's the Zoom, isn't it? Okay.
Thank you. Moving on to some of our beautification efforts um, previously and going forward. Uh, last year's uh, DID uh, put 20,000 into beautification efforts. And this year, again, I, I moved some of the marketing into the beautification efforts. Um, the downtown flowers program is something we all should be supporting all the time. It's so beautiful um, and it takes a lot of effort uh, and a lot of maintenance. So we pay somebody to water those flowers all summer. And I can tell you, it's been very dry and it's hard to stay on top of. So uh, we wanna make sure that if we're investing in putting the flowers out, that we can continue to maintain them. Um, and then there's some new plantings to recognize uh, in front of City Hall, City Hall Plaza. We had uh, two volunteers uh, replant much of those gardens and they have a hope that they can be better maintained so that we don't have to keep replanting them. So they added some fencing and, um, and got our, the waterer to continue to water those. And then there's hope that if there's more funding there and that that grows, then we can um, hire people to maintain these beautiful gardens that we're trying to start. Um, and uh, also downtown seasonal decorations and illumination we have always done uh, garlands on the lampposts that you might've seen and uh, wrapped them in lights. And I've been comparing our city with many other cities and noticing that um, there's a lot more potential for more illumination projects in, in downtown and um, just beautifying the natural cityscape that we have. Um, and so we will be purchasing more lights and we've been talking with a lighting designer about um, providing more decorative lighting during the darker times of year. Um, so that's one of our bigger projects that we're working on um, and we'll continue to support uh, the efforts in public art as Ward outlined. This was a collaborative piece um, on the Shaw's wall and I can't, I, now I can't even imagine that wall white. I mean, it's become such an essential part of our everyday. Um, and I think a lot of the art in, in town is like that. We're also um, helping with the public engagement piece a little bit. I wanted to mention, um, uh, we have somebody on the design committee who has a professional background in public engagement around art. She worked at the Hood Museum um, and she will be helping us and the Public Arts Commission um, to, uh, to uh, do the signage that they're talking about. And she'll be consulting um, with them a little bit on, on that piece and trying to get the public more involved with the art that is already downtown. Um, I mentioned many of these projects from 2022. Um, specifically, you can see 900 feet of fresh garland, 60 wreaths on 60 light poles, um, and then the plans for some new seasonal lights, plus continuing doing all of those things. You may have noticed the new M benches around town that were just installed this week. Um, their color is so vibrant and just brings to life and also accentuates the flowers and the plantings. Um, and, and, it, and they provide a space for people to sit and talk or even play games on one of the M benches by the School, school Street and Main Street uh, intersection, the top of the M bench has game boards, just so you know. So you can go and play a game of tic-tac-toe or checkers with a random person who's sitting across from you. So really trying to help people engage with one another in downtown. Um, and then this upcoming year, our plans in the public art category is repainting the Julio's parking lot mural. And in fact, I'll disclose that that painting that's planned is also gonna be very interactive, um, trying to get people to explore the painting more. And um, I can tell you more about these specific projects if you want. Um, that one will be done by Sabrina Fidial. Um, New flags across the river and projections across town. We have this projector we wanna use with this downtown illumination and seasonal lighting project. We wanna use it more. Um, we take inspiration from places like Quebec City uh, in Montreal where illumination is such an important part of their winters. 
I mentioned the new City Hall Plaza planting and the maintenance going forward. And here's some examples of what we have done. Um, I talk about projection. This is what I'm talking about. Fun projections uh, across town during the winter months. Um, and here's one of the M benches. And this one has the game boards, as you can see. And then this is kind of an example of how uh, plantings and flowers can bring a street to life and make it just look so much more attractive. So I believe that the more that we invest in, in that, uh, the more beautiful our streets are going to be and more welcoming. Oh, wrong button. Yeah, here we are. Event grants um, is another area. Uh, you know, we do a lot of events in downtown Montpelier um, and we have an event grant round that has been, uh, there's been funding there from the DID as well, $5,000 uh, in previous years and hopefully 5,000 going forward. Um, and this grant round, if you aren't already aware of it, um, we put like a, an application out there for community members to do their own events and with a panel um, with Montpelier Live and uh, other representatives, we decide on uh, a small number to fund and support because we believe that these events are, are very important to our downtown as well. As I stated, thousands of visitors uh, coming downtown to not only watch the event, but to eat and to shop, um, to stay. And it's really important to our local economy. Um, and these events strengthen our community. We have July 3rd coming up, um, which is something that people really count on every summer and uh, a place where we can connect downtown and other communities come and connect with us downtown. Um, and they create so much vibrancy. Uh, you can see we have uh, a few of examples from previous uh, grant rounds that we've had here. Um, we always try to integrate uh, events that have youth, that are diverse, um, that have youth engagement, that are diverse, and um, and really fun to watch and, and listen to. This is the Honey Bee Steel Band. They will be in our parade this year. They also played for a Halloween event. This is Animal Dance. Uh, there's going to be a huge dance performance on the State House lawn. Um, and this is Scrag Mountain Music's performance, um, which we we really like the events that they do and try to fund them each year. And this is July 3rd, um, just an example of what it means to bring people together. And um, I, I love seeing these photos with 10,000 people on the State House lawn, um, enjoying our downtown, enjoying the celebration, um, the show, whether it's a concert or fireworks. Um, and I hope that you will all be joining us on July 3rd, coming right up. Oh, back. So that's a summary of what we've done and what we plan to do, um, and no great changes. Uh, and I hope that you will continue to support our efforts. Thanks, Katie. This is great. And two feel good agenda items in a row. Two what? Two feel good yeah. items in a row. Did that? Yeah. Thank you, Donna. By one of your volunteers, that we as a council don't do very well thanking monthly or live volunteers, and she really had a good point. We probably could do better with all of our committees, but since you're here. I, I said to her in my response, I said, I'm trying to really make sure when we hear from Monthday or Live, which we usually do a couple times a year, that I express this. And I really want to go a step beyond and ask the city council to write a letter of appreciation and have all of us sign it. Uh, I've got a little draft here. Uh, city staff probably can do a better job, but something along the lines of 
thanking to all of Montpelier Live volunteers who graciously give their time, energies, and skills to the beautification, I like your word, mm -hmm. of our downtown. Their, your service services are steady, consistent, and improve to make our city more attractive and more lively with events. Something along that line. So I make a motion that we do this letter and that we all sign it and, and forward it to Montpelier Live Board and they can share it with their volunteers. So my suggestion would be, yeah. the motion would be, why don't we get a draft of it, put it on the consent agenda next week, and then after you prove it, we can wrote, circulate mm -hmm. it and have it signed by next meeting. Yeah, there, maybe yeah, yeah. I shouldn't That's have made a motion. Idea. I should have said, is it, a, is it a general idea that people approve of? So you could email it. Yeah. I think it's a good and I just wanted to mention, we recently put a report out that and counted each of our volunteers in the course of a single year, we have over 70 volunteers um, in many of the, these areas that I've identified, but mostly in the beautification. Um, but 70 volunteers who actually make it work, we're only one and a half staff members officially hired, a couple contracted employees, but um, mostly volunteers. So it's greatly appreciated, the recognition. Yeah, people love the flowers, love the... Uh all the stuff you do to decorate downtown, the events, the parade, everything. So I think that's a great idea, Donna. Anything else from the members of the council? Okay. Thank Someone you. should make a motion to approve the budget. Yep. Second. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Hi. Anyone opposed? Okay. I'll just say that since Keith and George have been a delight to work with, and so if any of the Montpelier Alive people are listening to that, um, we've really appreciated working with you and getting stuff done and really great communication between all of us. So thanks. Oh, and before you sit down, could you or Evelyn, could you unshare? a lot of coordination you said uh with the public arts are you also doing it with the parks um yes for the marketing okay. well for, for, for the sure. whole outside adventure destination yeah. and good absolutely that's um completely a, a collaborative experience and in fact i believe that there's a whole other phase of that collaboration and um it's going to affect uh the build out of that adventure site over the next couple years good. yeah Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now we are on to item 11 or 12, depending on uh, which version of the agenda you're looking at. The uh, public uh, second reading on the uh, proposed ordinance for uh, public intoxication. And I'll start by opening the public hearing. And so. Uh, as you know, this is our second reading of this ordinance. Uh, Chief, I don't know if you want to do the quick highlights of uh, what we're proposing. I, I can, yeah. My name is Eric Nordenson, a police chief, and I'm hoping for three in a row, so for three good things in a row. Um, the, the primary objective of this ordinance was to decriminalize a lot of behaviors that we're seeing in town and offer a restorative option and also uh, a, an opportunity for treatment. So when we're looking at two in a row, I think this is three, the, the, the options that we are presenting are, are very good for the end user and the person that we deal with. Um, I think you have the ordinance and the, re the revisions in front of you. Um, I've also shared the policy and made the correction that you noticed uh, last time on there. Um, there's simple typos sometimes get me, um, but yeah, I think it, you know, it's been supported by Turning Point. It's been supported by the police review committee. I think uh, it's been supported by um, the Community Justice Center. Um, and I think we'll see some benefits if we can help one person that's suffering from any issues and get restorative justice and turning point. We've done a pretty good job, so. Great. Uh, any, any members of the public who'd like to address this issue, either in the building or on Zoom? Seeing none. Oh, uh, Tim. It's very carefully and thoroughly done. Just didn't understand 
for example, it says it several times, but first offense in a 12 month period shall be punishable by a fine of $50. And then it says the waiver fee shall be $25. What's the waiver fee? So, so what happens when you issue a civil ticket is they have two separate fines. And if you accept the fine and just pay it, that's the waiver fee. Otherwise, if you go to court, we would be the prosecutor of the court. The fee could go up to that number. So there's, there's usually two fines. So if you just like, say, hey, I'm going to go pay this, the waiver fee is what you can pay. Thanks. I'm curious, has there been public comment on this? I mean, it would happen at this meeting, wouldn't it? Yeah. So. Yeah, we've had two opportunities plus the time we presented yeah. it and, um, and then just met with stakeholders that, that seem pretty supportive on all of it. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, I will close the public hearing and we would entertain a motion. As presented. Any discussion? Yes, Lauren. Is there, like I saw in what's in the, um, in the packet that like one of the sentences cuts off, is that what you said? There was a typo that got there was, uh, I had a typo in our draft policy. Okay. And I don't know if this is exa the exact language we're adopting that's in the um, cover letter or just because I see the, the last um, right before effective date on the final page, it says as pair, I think it's city charter, but it doesn't say that. Just, just, we'll just yeah, per city add charter. that. <laughs> just get that wording right. So it's not a dangling pair. Um, so I might friendly amend or just fix that really fit yeah <laughs> um and i just while i have the microphone just wanted to thank the chief this is again just reiterating appreciation for um continuing with um you know the important work that the police review committee did and it's great to see this move um in this direction i think it's a great upgrade to our policy um and definitely saw some chatter um on some thread for the police review committee folks who are still really interested and in just um, overall appreciation there too. So just for sure. Thank you. All right. Are you ready to vote? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We've adopted it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next up, East State Street Reconstruction Project. Kurt, while you're getting set up, I'll just mention, yep, I, I appreciate the quick response to the request for the speed limit sign on, uh, on Town Street. My neighbors were asking for it, and just like that, it was up there. So I, I, know, I know people in the neighborhood really appreciated that. Excellent. Some issues are easy to fix. Yeah, I noticed, I noticed that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kurt, you're up. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. All right. I'm Kurt Modica, Director of Public Works. Uh, so, uh, here to talk about the East State Street Reconstruction Project. Um, just a, a brief overview of that project. We are uh, separating the stormwater out of the sewer system to reduce combined sewer overflows from the river and um, reconstructing East State Street, including all the utility work, which is uh, water sewer storm, as well as streetscape. And as part of our funding approval for this project, we need to hold a public hearing um, on the environmental impacts of the project. Uh, we did an environmental review. And... So I will open the public hearing. Yes, great, thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, we did an environmental review and really the only impact noted was work within the floodplain. So as a part of the project is along State Street um, to bring a new stormwater outfall to the river and that work is in the floodplain. Um, so um, like I said, as part of uh, the funding clearance, this is an, uh, a public hearing to address comments or concerns on uh, potential other environmental impacts on the project if, uh, if the public has any. Open it to, Thank to you. The, the chair will recognize any member of the public who wishes to be heard on this item. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing.
Do you need any further action from us or just the fact that we did it? Okay. All right. Next up, uh, 2023 project update. Well, uh, Evan, Evelyn said, uh, no, this is her first big major presentation. Uh, has just done a great job on this. Um, you may recall at, uh, when we did the orientation, we did a quick list of all the projects and is in a sort of an attempt to help our new members become more familiar as well as the public and remind uh, ongoing council members of exactly uh, at least the big things that are on our table. We just want to run through. So this is basically a run through just an update of what's on the plate and obviously happy to answer any questions about any of them, but it's really an informational piece. And I'll turn it over to our communications coordinator, Evelyn Prim. Timed intro, Bill. Um, so as everybody, uh, or most of the people in this room know, I, uh, I'm Evelyn Prim. I'm the communications coordinator for the city. Um, and so I'm going to give a, uh, a very high level overview of the projects um, that are. I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't think you're sharing yet. Oh, thank you. Let's see. Oh, yep. It's so hard to tell when it's shared and when it's not. Okay. Yes. All right. Take two. So, yeah. There we go. All right, I think they'll hide down there. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just to, again, to reiterate, so I'm gonna give a very high level overview of these projects um, that are in uh, some level of progression um, one way or the other. I am involved in some of these to varying degrees, but I am not gonna get into the details uh, here. Um, and I'll ask that you direct all project specific questions to the appropriate department leader um, as they'll be able to give you a much better uh, detailed answer than I will. The two that are here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Why are we not moving? Oh my gosh, right? Yeah. My screen is frozen. There we go. All right, so uh, starting right off with the crowd favorite Country Club Road. Uh, this project is a joint effort between the Planning and Community Development Par Department and the City Manager's Office. Um, and as you all know, this project is transitioning from the planning stage to the preparation phase. Uh, the budget for this master planning uh, phase one is 400,000. Um, and as we all know, this is a long-term project, so the timeline spans several years. Um, the next action item um, for the project team is to propose the actionable master plan, um, and that'll happen at the next city council meeting on June 28th. Um, and the proposal will outline the specific steps needed to move from concept to implementation. Um, also, the city will continue master planning activities with the recreation department uh, to develop the proposal for the recreation uh, community zone that has been designated on the, on the project site. Uh, moving right along, the water resource recovery facility uh, is, uh, this is one of several DPW projects um, on deck tonight. This project is underway and it involves the odor control, a secondary settling tank, uh, the rehab of a biosolids drying um, station, and uh, the evaluation of heating alternatives for DPW facilities. Uh, the design is expected to be completed by the end of the month and the construction is anticipated to start in December of next year. Uh, the current action is uh, the final design contract. Uh, next up is the Barry and Main Street intersection. Uh, so this is uh, continuing right along with DPW's uh, projects. Um, and uh, this is a complex project because it involves uh, many overlapping uh, state and local jurisdictions. The, uh, the budget for this project is 550,000. And construction is projected to begin next summer. Um, and the current next action is to execute the final design contract. All right, next up is East State Street, um, as Kurt just mentioned, um, another down, uh, downtown DPW project. This project is currently in the final design phase and preparing to go out to bid this summer for contract one. 
Uh, the project is, uh, is, has two contracts, each covering a portion of the work. And the total budget for this project is uh, anticipated at 7.2 million. Um, and the next action is to prepare the process uh, for bidding. All right, we have the city plan next. Um, and this is another multi-year effort that has been underway since 2018. Only a review of the earlier approved, um, or only a review of the earlier approved drafts uh, of the homelessness section and housing com uh, components are left. The planning department is expecting to have a draft of this plan completed by October of this year. And the next step is to finish uh, the chapter and the, um, the IS development and prepare for rollout um, and public input. And I will be uh, assisting the planning department on putting together the storyboard for this project, which will align with the public input process. Uh, the reappraisal is currently underway as um, city assessor Marty Lagerstead mentioned um, back at the beginning of May, uh, it's currently underway. And um, so Marty will be a, a guest on the very first episode of our new podcast, A Minute in Montpelier. Um, so be sure to tune in to that on uh, Spotify on June 29th uh, to listen to our first show. And he's gonna go into all the details. Uh, next is the stormwater utility back again to DPW. Um, this project was underway, but is currently on hold due to staffing. Um, a quick reminder for those who may not be uh, familiar with this, the stormwater utility is a fund to help replace aging infrastructure um, and maintenance uh, and fund maintenance operations uh, and water quality projects. Uh, the water sewer rates are also being reviewed in conjunction with the stormwater utility. Um, so in a nutshell, the uh, utility will be funded through a fee based on area that on areas that contribute to stormwater runoff. Um, and DPW anticipates uh, this will be implemented um, in the summer, uh, next, next summer in July. All right. All right. Um, we've got Confluence Park coming up. Um, so this is another project that you've had uh, several excellent presentations on. Um, so I'm not gonna rehash much of the details tonight, um, but at this point, the contractor is currently finishing up the design contract and the scope of the services include the final design uh, plans, uh, CA, the CAP amendment, uh, construction costs estimates, final technical specifications, final operations and maintenance plan, and uh, securing permits. Um, and the design is expected to be completed by this summer, um, at which time uh, the Vermont River Conservancy will continue uh, fundraising for construction. And that is what I just said. Um, the uh, proposed U32 trail uh, jumps over to the Parks Department, um, and this is on the, the horizon. The Parks Department is currently working on, uh, or currently working with property owners to secure the location of the trail and gain permission um, from them to construct it. And the current budget is anticipated at uh, 980,000. Um, and the, uh, yeah, the, next, the next action item is uh, to, to move forward with uh, land homer, landowner permission and permits. Uh, some other parks projects on the horizon um, is uh, improving the downtown tree wells to accom accommodate larger older growth trees, removing four dams in the city and creating a trail connecting the downtown Hubbard Park and uh, the West Park neighborhood um, and the North Branch Park and the pool and rec fields. Um, going back over to DPW, the uh, converting the DPW garage and equipment barn to net zero. The plan is to convert uh, the buildings to a combination of biogas and wood pellet heat sources. Um, they are currently awaiting design and budget for the contractors and engineers. The project is contingent on the uh, water resource recovery, recovery facility phase two design. Um, and the next action is to be determined. Um, lots of other DPW projects. Uh, this is one of two slides. Um, so there's a long list here that you can, that you can review. Um, Continuing on down there. All right. Uh, the Cemetery Commission is working to renovate the vault building at Greenmount Cemetery to meet their growing needs. The project would be a total rehabilitation of the historic structure into a modernized building uh, with a heating chapel, uh, bathrooms, and office space. 
Um, I'll be speaking with uh, Cemetery Commissioner Pat Healy and members of the commission in September on our podcast. Um, so I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about all those details. So tune in there as well. Um, the public restroom, um, our legislative delegation uh, commented on this quite a bit, uh, but Montpelier's newest committee has been tasked with evaluating the needs for a public restroom in the downtown. Um, the results of their work thus far has been a map and a list of current public restroom locations um, and ours, uh, which is available on the city's website. And um, we are working with uh, the committee to uh, get this in a, uh, a handout form that we can distribute to Montpelier Alive business businesses and any, uh, any um, public entities that would like a copy as well. Um, and they have also placed uh, portalettes behind, the, uh, behind City Hall in the Blanchard lot and at the Senior Activity Center to provide a restroom option during the underserved um, overnight hours. And their next action is, uh, is in the works at this point as well. Installation of EV chargers. Um, so this is to support the city's fleet transition um, to electric vehicles to meet uh, net zero goals. The project is in development and it, we are in cur currently awaiting the design and budget from electrical uh, contractors for chargers at uh, MPD and City Hall. Um, again, the homelessness uh, facility that the de legislative delegation um, spoke on extensively. Uh, so this is another project um, that is a, um, a uh, it would be a multi-purpose facility to support the underhoused uh, people in our community. Um, so a feasibility study and asbestos testing are underway at the rec center building on Berry Street, um, as this is being considered as a possible location for the facility. The budget for the restoration work needed is approximately uh, 50,000 to rehab the country club road building and possibly uh, several million to make improvements to the rec center. Um, and the next actions are in the works based on those assessments. Um, and the future of Barry, uh, the Barry Rec Center is uh, basically in line exactly with um, the assessment on the, uh, the asbestos facility. Um, and again, that next action is 2BD um, and the timeline will depend on that study. And that is all I have. Thank you so much. This is really great. Thanks, Evelyn. Any comments or questions from members of the council? It's very comprehensive. Yeah, uh, Carrie, I see you've got your hand up. So your hand. Yes, first. thank you. Um, I have a question about the public restroom topic. Um, so I noticed there's a budget listed there of 180,000 for an attendant for the city hall restrooms and I would like to know a little bit more detail about where that number came from. So the the so there is no budget I think um, just to be clear it was an estimate of what it would cost I think at some point there had been a request to possibly have city hall restrooms open uh, 24 hours and so we did an estimate of what it would cost to have an attendant here full time you know over the nights um, but there's no there's no budget for that it's just that was uh, I believe Chris Lumber put that together. I would love to know more detail about where the where 180,000 came from. So uh, yes, we'd be happy to provide that. Uh, I think you know Great. when you talk about 24 hour coverage, you're talking about three shifts uh, of you know not during the day but weekends, and so yes, I, I we can tell you where it came from. Uh, okay, great. Well, I, I guess I just want to suggest that. 24 hour coverage might be excessive for um, um, you know restrooms that are currently open during the day to the public and we, are without 24 hour coverage. We, so. We are, uh, so I also want to be clear, we're not necessarily proposing that that be a solution. That was a solution that was suggested to us. And so we costed it out. It was not something that I don't believe the public restroom committee has endorsed or the city is recommending. So it was just an estimate. If if we were to do that, that's what it would cost. It's not, it's not a recommendation from me or our staff to that we do that. I understand. Thank you, Tim. Just along the same line of that conversation. So, Could you seems like you need a to lot get of these are a little more. I'm sorry. A lot of these are dreams or goals or aspirations, but 
not necessarily all approved budget items yet. So we'll still be able to review them when they come up for Correct. the final. So all of them are projects that have been identified one way or another as something that's in our pipeline that we're working on. As you can see, some are, you know, very well detailed, already approved budgets by voters and others. Are in, and the whole point of this was to sort of show which ones are, where things are at. And some are very conceptual and preliminary and others are fixed. So yes, that's exactly right. But they're all there. I, I think the point of this, just to be clear, is that they're all active things that city staff are working on, in addition to you know the stuff that we all talk about here. So, you know, there's plenty happening at different different stages. You had a question actually. You asked me during the break, and I'll be happy to answer it because other people may have the same question about Confluence Park, uh, whether that was or were not approved. And for the for the new council members' uh, benefit, and and maybe one of the prior counselors can jump in here. We did get a presentation in you know, January, February about Confluence Park and uh, the potential costs and efforts. And the city council at that point said, you know, basically we're not putting any more city money into this than what we've already allocated. Uh, and they gave them 18 months, I believe, to sort of complete the design. The design is from the grant that we have to complete the design and, and seek funding. Uh, from other sources. Um, so they didn't, the council didn't, you know, please correct me if I'm saying this wrong, the council didn't kill the project, but also said, we don't come to us for any more money than what we've already allocated. That That's my uh, recollection of it too. You know, there was a lot of discussion because that was in the lead up to the city meeting and uh, the budget vote and what we're, what are we doing with all the uh, the bonds because we were uh amending the terms of that the bond that incorporated the funding for uh confluence park and we wanted to make clear to the voters that we nobody on council was supporting going spending any money any city money beyond the roughly 600,000 that had been voted by the uh, voters in March of 2022 and uh, no matter how, I, I think it pays to keep repeating that to people that nobody here is supporting spending any more money on this project other than the money that has already been approved in a bond. And the uh, supporters of the project really were quite optimistic at about their ability to raise the money, which would go get us up to two or $3 million. Um, and so we said, well, okay, you're, you're entitled to, we'll give you the shot because some of the money like that design contract is already committed. And if we didn't go forward with that contract, we would have to give the money back to the, uh, to the funder that, uh, that gave it to us because it wasn't city funds. And so they it's they have the opportunity to uh, to show us that the money's there before eighteen months before we go forward um, with anything more. Donna, what you what Bill said, we did give them eighteen months, but the idea was that then we could reassess whether we still want them to hold that money as defined or as applying to the confluent park or not. But until then, we're holding it to give them a chance to make up the money difference. Yeah, there were some people who wanted to on council wanted to reprogram that money immediately. Others have said, "Well, let's let's give them a chance and and see where we come out." Okay. Any other questions before we thank Evelyn? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Evelyn. Okay, I I don't think we have any other business. So city council reports start at this end of the table this tonight. Ms. Hurl. A couple of quick things. Um, just for the record, during the ledge update, I just remembered the PFAS bill, which so this is a bill that would ban PFAS for more products. So less is going into the landfill and ultimately leachate. Um, that passed the Senate, but it is sitting in the House. So that will probably be on our agenda again next year <laughs> to, to finish the job, just 
because uh, the legislators couldn't remember. The feds aren't doing that? They aren't banning it? No, I mean, there's things happening, but the EPA, it's like in 15 years, they'll probably get around to banning it. And the states in the meantime can act. The EU is moving ahead with like a full scale ban, potentially, though they're way ahead of us. But um, the o- only other update, um, the um, Montpelier Energy uh, Committee is having a strategic planning session next week. Um, so if anyone has ideas, it's a time when we're going to really be looking at ideas and priorities. So would welcome if people have thoughts, um, you know, feel free to shoot a message or pop in for the public comment at the beginning or, or anything, but, you know, it's a time, um, you know, and welcome the public to offer ideas too, because it's when we can really think creatively about, you know, how we're meeting our net zero goals. Um, and, you know, we've got the specific city goals, but also, um, you know, it's a moment there's so many new federal incentives and things. So are there ways that we can be, you know, letting our community members know about opportunities to be um, taking advantage of that kind of stuff. So um, just wanted to, so that's Tuesday evening, 6.30 to nine um, in city council chambers um, or the room, the room here. And um, I guess my, my only last question was, I couldn't exactly tell from how the uh, retreat conversation ended. It looked like it was inconclusive <laughs> for the meeting that I apologize. I missed the end of, okay. Yeah, it's not Sorry. inconclusive. It, we we decided to do it. It's a matter of finding a date. We're, we're finding a date. Too so. busy. Everybody's too busy. <laughs> okay. Is there a doodle poll going? <laughs> and some, summer is tough because is tough. Um, people go away. Yeah, okay. Uh, Tim. Just just because we received, I think you all received a piece from Resilient Montpelier, an email today, maybe? I don't yes. know I saw it. Um, just thinking it might be appropriate because it was addressed to all of us in the city manager that maybe to request that city staff um, assist in preparing a response to this. Because uh, there's several points in here, cost of water system repairs and grand list and a couple of other pieces, um, just to make sure we get accurate information back to them, if that's okay. Oh, I don't know if I saw that, yeah. but uh, I kind of wrote all over mine, but no, okay. I can get you a clean copy. Yeah. I, I did not see that. Did you forward it to all Yeah. Anyway, I got it in my city email. Yeah, that's where I saw it. Yeah. Okay. I, after you mentioned it, I was looking for it. Okay. I'll forward it to you yeah. just to be sure. Forward it to all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And we are happy to provide Great. And the cell? No, I was going to mention the the Energy Committee um, planning meeting. Um, so any ideas you've got, Lauren and I will both be there. So send it our way. Great. Uh, Carrie? I, I have no report tonight. Thanks. Donna? No, thank you. All right. Well, it's very rare for you, Donna. <laughs> I will know. <laughs> um, Mayor's report, just uh, a couple of items. Uh, one, I let uh, all members of the council know that I did fill in the application for the mayor and uh, council to march in the in the parade, and um, so those of us who have done it before know it's a lot of fun. So I encourage all the members of the council to to be there and do it. Um, more information to come, I think. Um, news from the board of the wood art gallery we've we're going through a process of uh, hiring a new executive director and uh, the uh, hiring committee has identified someone who will be uh, is going to be in, identi- interviewed by the board next week and i i just was very surprised and gratified that we were able to get applicants so quickly because i know from my professional experience lately. It's been very hard to get people to apply for anything. So I think this is uh, good news. We we seems like we had more than one uh, very qualified applicant. And so that's, that's going to be coming. Um, and all right. 
I guess I'm going to stop at that because the next thing, whatever is there, is uh, something that I can't read my handwriting on. So I will. Uh, I'm I'm sure I will. Cipher to use mail privilege. I'll come back to it. Yeah. Um, so up to the uh, clerk. The LCT framing thing. Okay. I just mentioned that those if you're curious just the way it's going to play out after talking to the assessor's offices we'll probably start those actual bca hearings in late august when they'll begin and i'm just going to like grab thursdays and just rather than try to plan a new one every week just say every i think thursday at like six o'clock we're going to have it and just blo you know block off as many of those as you can because it's going to be a long haul do we know uh, from the outcome of Grievance Day, do you have any kind of estimate of how many people? Uh, you know, it's very hard to tell because we, we don't have the formal grievance process yet. That comes up soon. So there's been this sort of informal pre-grievance. Uh -huh. um, if you, 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 had, you made me guess, I would think it'd be around what it was last time, which I think was around 60. Um, I think that's probably where we're headed. Yeah, and then... Oh, a few years before that, we had 80, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, so, and I recall it started on August 21st that year. Yeah, I could so, really jinx us by just saying 60. It definitely could be more, but that's that's where I'm thinking we're going. Well, I, I'm working on ideas to make the process go uh, in a more streamlined fashion, so hopefully that will uh, <laughs> get get us through the process faster. So 80 will seem like 60. Yeah. City manager's report. Uh, sure. Uh, for what it's worth, I, I, don't, I don't have more information on the number, but we certainly aren't hearing the kind of um, outcry that we've heard in prior reappraisals. So I don't know whether that translates to less people grieving or going through the process, but I, you know, and we just haven't, you know, gotten that kind of feedback. I only have a couple things, um, very brief, and they touch on stuff we've already talked about. So we have had been holding summits every week, uh, this week being the exception on Wednesdays, with the cities, cities of Montpelier and Barrie in the town of Berlin, and a large swath of the nonprofit service providers in central Vermont, and a couple of representatives from the Agency of Human Services and some interested residents that have been attending. We've just been calling them summits on uh, really to prepare for the exodus from the hotel. And while we've talked some about the policy of extending the hotels, we've really focused on let's just assume it's going to happen and how do we prepare for what we're going to do. But as part of that, we discussed the this funding that the states asked us to submit applications for. And we went through a long list of things that uh, might be helpful in the region and then divided those up by um, the appropriate, the, sort of the logical group to apply for them. So obviously Good Sam's gonna apply for shelter, et cetera. So the, the suggestion was that the city would apply for public restrooms uh, because we need them and whether, and um, and we've been trying you know, to get the state to have public restrooms anyway. But um, so that was where it fell to us, but I did not want to proceed with that. Uh, we don't. You know, we'll probably be in a two day determined location um, and, you know, we'd have to come up with some sort of budget, but I wanted to at least just get a head nod around the table that that was where we were at. I mean, you know, there's a lot of other things being applied for from central Vermont by all the various agencies, um, but that's where we're headed. So if you hear that we've applied and you've been told. That's yes. I can't hear. Oh, it's my mic. Yeah, there you go. Oh, okay. Um, just just knowing that we're looking at like rec center, possible upgrades or something for emergency shelter space. Is that part of the conversation? Yes. So, there as well? Yeah. Um, so I don't think the, the amount of funding that the state has for would, would be even close to what would come to the rec and, and you will will be getting that engineering report later this year. It, one of the options that we're talking about and might tie into that would be those bathrooms 
So to figure out what it would take to sort of upgrade all those bathrooms and showers and put a direct access in, so you don't have to make the whole building accessible, but people could go. So those, that is one of the options on the table. Um, and then, you know, a couple others. So I think we we'll probably just apply for a sum of money with a couple of potential locations and obviously defer to the, you know, get the public bathroom committee involved and uh, and see what they think about it. But we also we do also have some other money set aside so that, you know, the town could maybe do something like that. So that's that's the thinking, but we do not want to get out ahead of the council and or the public restroom committee as far as picking a location. But if we can get some funding, uh, and you know, in terms of in terms of information we received tonight, uh, that the state was willing to pay to keep the transit center uh, bathrooms open uh, all day. That that was new information that we had not heard from any official source prior to today. Um, yeah, Bill, I did want to just. I'm glad you mentioned about um, involving the public restroom committee with that proposal and. Um, if you could get any thoughts to the committee before we meet next time or before you submit applications or something, I think that would be really helpful um, so that there's coordination so you can get that input. And so, because sure. that committee has been talking about a lot of different approaches to public restrooms and um, and I think it doesn't meet again for another couple of weeks. So it's right. And I've been coordinating with Chris to try to get, you know, him to, translate what, what the ideas that the committee has been, uh, you know, talking about. And I, again, I don't think I would send in any money with a specific proposal that this is what we want. It would probably be, we'd like X number of dollars. Here's some potential locations that this could go um, so that we're not tied into anything. I just, because I, I agree, there's a lot of ideas. Okay, all set. Great, we will be in adjournment at 9.41 p.m.